Look at that. We are actually completely and utterly live. That's quite exciting, isn't it? So I've just got some little buttons to click here. And here we, here we are. Go. Hello, Hello, everybody. Welcome to the workshop. Welcome to our very first Workshop Diaries Live. Very exciting. And welcome, really, to the beginning of the next season, season two. Can't wait. Well, you don't have to. It's dying now. I know. It's very exciting, isn't it? So how was your, how was your, uh, your, your two-month uh, vacation? Well, thank you. Well, it was, it was a little bit complicated. Obviously, we popped out to Norway and just yep. go and see the folks because, uh, well, the in-laws, because we'd yep. been out there for... Well, we hadn't been out there for two years, thanks to the pandemic, so okay. obviously that was quite difficult. When we got there, had a bit of a family crisis. Unfortunately, my father-in-law was very ill, life-changing illness, and it took about two months for us to kind of get them back into a new way of thinking. But oh, we yeah. were there, it was okay, it was lovely and snowy, which was great. I did have my nice gloves, just in case I was cold. I had my tools, so I could do a little bit of work, and hopefully many of you have already seen the shorts I had to go at, so I'm going to sort of experiment with those, which would be quite good fun. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you've managed to get everything resolved. It's pretty much resolved. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good we're getting there. I mean, but what have you been up to? Well, I just said two months kind of recharging you know just taking it easy tinkering in the garage you yeah. know just doing general bits and pieces <laughs> nothing but, but glad to be back <laughs> well that's fantastic i mean it's, it's kind of like i guess you know when you're working at home is it much the same or even different from what you're doing here it's completely different one i don't have to start early which is is always a bonus <laughs> and i just sort of walk out the back door uh, down to the garage yeah. and uh, away i go so happy that days very handy that yeah. is very very cool uh, awesome stuff. Now you're going to have to bear with us a little bit. This is a whole new load of technology. It's like flying the space shuttle. Got all kinds of stuff going on. We've got lots of your lovely comments coming up on the right hand side, so I can see what's going on. But I'm also looking at what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is quite exciting. So it's all good. So let's have a little look. Well, I, I suppose first of all, we owe you a little bit of an apology, don't we? Because this episode we had promised in Practical yep. Classics magazine, no less, no other places as well. In fact, the copy is here. Yeah. I had mentioned that obviously we're going to be cleaning a rusty chassis. John's rusty chassis, the Range Rover chassis, with a laser. It's yep. a super cool technology. What, why are we doing that again? Well, as in, why are we doing a really, really cool thing on the show? Why are we really restoring the Range Rover? <laughs> well, we're past that decision. It's okay. happening. Yeah, we are okay. going to this thing. Today. I know. Oh, sentimental value. Exactly. I know. And it's I an know. excuse, because okay. we don't really mind if it doesn't go well. No. It's an excuse to pl try out things like the laser, yeah, which no. is quite exciting. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a brilliant machine. Yeah, it is very, very yeah. cool. And the thing is, we actually got... Um, we've got some chaps, a company called Naran, they do these amazing laser cleaners, a thousand watt pulse laser, and they came all the way over from the Czech Republic, and despite all the storms that the world threw at them, they managed to get here just about in time, which was wonderful. We plugged everything in, thanks to our yeah, key electrics yeah, in the barn. Did really well. We then yeah. blew up some power supplies. Yeah, which was unfortunate. We had smoke coming out the machine. We did indeed. Which it was, wasn't a good thing. It was a little bit tricky. And I think the thing is, it was, you know, we had, well, we had all kinds of stuff. I got a little picture of us worrying about all the stuff that was coming out of the machine, which was a bit of a problem. So that oh, was that, the first that, thing. That so we, we managed to thank, thanks to Scott, actually give a shout out to Scott for actually finding some power supplies. Well, Ian found some power supplies. Scott, Scott went, and got, went them. and got them. We fitted them, them faffed around, got it all working again, which was fantastic. And we did actually get to do a little bit of laser we cleaning. Did. So I can show you here. Yeah, we did some more. Yeah, look at that machine. It's fab, isn't it? Isn't that just awesome? I had to put a little bit of oil, a bit of XCP there just to see what would happen. And it burns, as you might expect, which is quite exciting. So that was very, very cool. So yes, we have sort of, we had, we had a go, which was rather good. And then we kind of got into actually filming, making the episode for you. And when we actually managed to sort of get going, we sort of do all the different angles yep, of the shots, yep. lots of close-ups, all that kind of stuff. Suddenly, we ended up having a little bit of a power cut. So you can see here, we were filming away, faffing yeah, about. It was going really well. And then having a little bit of time lapse just to see what was going on. And suddenly, the lights went out, which was not cool. No, it wasn't. So, that was the end of play. Now, obviously, we had a bit of issue with that. The next day, so we all went to home, of course, at that point. The next day, yeah. we managed to get hold of a generator. Which was really good. Which was really good, except it didn't entirely work properly. So I had to get another, another generator. generator. Yeah. I had to rewire some of the workshop, actually, just to get the whole thing working. Yeah, because we obviously got three phase, we've got single phase. So it was a bit of a bit of a nightmare, but we actually got there in the end. And we had to make good. everything safe, so of course, that we weren't affecting anybody so else while we were playing. Laser around. working again. That was fantastic. So we continued. Yeah, exactly that, which was great. Um, but then, as it turned out, I should show you the tree on the power line you see that was what actually caused our little power cut which is a problem um but as i say that didn't actually give us any that's, issues that's always a problem is it with overhead power cables and they should put them in the ground yeah, they should put them in the they ground do. and but trees and everything else maybe they should have a thing no trees near overhead power cables yeah or maybe every single building in the universe should have its own power supply just magic yeah i don't know yeah. anyway we'll think about that later but yeah so so anyway we got we got back to working on again then we had another bit of an issue so unfortunately then we had we'd obviously the power cut had caused some problem with the chiller part of the laser obviously the laser's a very expensive bit of gear it's about 200 grand actually so 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 there we are working out what was going on and it, then and then we sort of got that working and then eventually a little bit later on after that we ended up having another problem. Yeah, I think it was, it was a coolant leak. 
Yes, so we'd obviously caused a bit of an issue with that. So it was a bit of a nightmare. So we've had a real week of it so far. And then eventually, obviously, the, thankfully, they, they managed to sort of sort out the trees. Somebody chopped out all the little bits and pieces, got the power guys in. We've sorted out the, uh, the, the issue yeah, of the so, power lines. Yeah, so the power's back on, generator's gone back. So now, that's how we can talk to you here without the hum of a generator in the background. Just the yeah. hum of the traffic. And then the obviously, books. did a bit more lasering. We did, yes. And then unfortunately, the machine packed up again. Yeah, we had it. I think basically we blew out a lot of bits and pieces when we were messing around with the power. So thankfully, the guys who got Antonin and Davida very, very kindly, kind of very heroically actually packed the thing up. We've gone back to the Czech Republic and now sorting it all out. And they're going to come back again to hopefully, hopefully, hope we can actually soon. finish the job. So as soon as that's happened, we're going to pop an episode up. We're hoping it'll be in time for next week. Look, yep, look forward Fingers to it. Fingers crossed. If it's not, it'll be the week after that, probably. But we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for all your comments. It's fantastic. There are so many whizzing past. It's really rather wonderful. I will. Hang on, I'm just, I'm just going to try and work out all the different things I'm supposed to be looking at here. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually what we should do, yeah, we should okay. do actually, yeah, go on is a little new thing. We've got Bid of the Week. Okay. And this week, Bid of the Week is actually sponsored by H&H, which is quite exciting. So I'm just going to pop down here to that. Look at that. There you go. Yeah, we'll go. Awesome. How we'll flash go. is this? <laughs> now, basically, they've got a, an auction coming up at Doxford. Duxford even, sorry, that's where the Aeroplane Museum is. Oh, this is, this is, I think, is obviously old footage. Yes, yeah, this isn't a new one. This is an impressive. Place. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Nice so it's obviously worth a little visit and stuff. Now, obviously, they've got, you've had a look through the catalogue. Obviously, the consignment's finished. Obviously, if you have yeah, a car yeah. that you want to sell, of course, they're going to be open consignments for the next auction. Yeah. But um, obviously, yeah, I did have a little flick through, yeah. and uh, the Jensen CV8 kind of took my eye. Yes. So, yeah. That's very cool, isn't it? Yeah, lovely looking car. Yeah. It is quite nice. I approve of the colour. But yeah. um, you know, but why, why particularly that model? Obviously, we did one on wheeler dealers and the later models. So yeah, we did an interception on wheeler dealers. Um, but that one in particular. So back in the early '80s, when I was just a, a mere boy, yeah. um, a friend of mine had a boat, and he used to keep it moored at St Catherine's Dock nice. in London. Okay, yeah. Unfortunately, he developed an oil leak from the front cover oil seal. So was it the dock or the boat? The boat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so he said to me, "Look, Paul, yeah. if you fix my boat for me, then you can have my old Jensen." I've ah, got that's amazing. Garage. So, so I thought, great. So I fixed his boat, and true to his word, he gave me his Jensen CV8. That's fantastic. So was yours the same colour as that? No, one? mine was midnight blue. Okay. Um, but other with, than that, um, it's almost yeah, the same. Exactly the same. Yeah. Didn't have any bumpers on it, but okay. it was a, such a cool car. Yeah. And they've got a nice American, I think, Chrysler V8 engine. Yeah, so, well, that, that was one of the things about yeah. the Jensen, wasn't it? They looked Lovely good car. and they went well. Yeah, so, so what. what what takes your fancy? Well, I think there, there's something here that I thought was a bit interesting. So basically, it's a, an E-Type Jag. It's 1965 and uh, Series 1, obviously a very good yeah, one. And yeah. it's been owned by the same family since 1971, Wow, which is wonderful. But it was put up on blocks in 1973 uh, just so they could do a bit of work on the brake calipers. But obviously, as you can see, it stayed there forevermore yeah. so so basically that's it's, it's an actual barn find it was left in the barn or in the garage wow. and obviously it's, it's it's one of those very very cool things that'd be rather fun yeah. to play with you know sort of going forward so but it obviously seems rather familiar with the range rover so basically if you imagine how rusty that is and how yeah. much of a project that is it's the same sort of mission exactly yeah, yeah. no it will be a mission you know but the least you can get you can get all the parts for e-types yeah. and everything else so it's cool. well, I, think, I think the main difference of course between the jag and the range rover is of course is the range rover is going to be worth nothing when we finish whereas the e-type is going to be worth a fortune yeah. now the lovely thing is we should say hi to everybody if we've got argentina brazil sicily, sicily france, france and speak slower okay yeah well i'm excited apologize. to be here i'm really sorry we'll, we'll <laughs> okay uh, hello savage media Thank you very much for saying hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> this is very exciting because everything is going on. It's absolutely amazing. So we've got these comments going all over the place. Now, where were we? So, yes, so well, basically, if you, if you like either of those two bids, you want to go and see some more, check out the H&H &H website. Obviously, then you can see some details about all the things that yeah, are going to be on the bid. Yeah, 16th of March. And, yeah, and get yourself down to Duxford. It'd be fantastic. Now, something else we should do before we get on to answering okay, all your questions yeah. is obviously at Christmas, we actually mentioned a little competition. So five lucky winners were going to win some Milwaukee tools. So we're going to have... Like a little power, uh, sort of uh, impact driver and an angle grinder. Yeah, so who are the winners then? Well, that's a really good question. You've had, we've had so many entries, and thank you very much for entering. One of my sort of homework projects, if you like, while we were away in Norway, was okay. to actually go through and pick the winners. I'm, let's say I'm still in that process. You will be a nut told when you get them, but it has not happened yet. So maybe next week or the week okay, after. I'll wait the uh, email. Yes. Thank so you. There's five lucky winners. You can put the other ones back. So oh, okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> cool stuff. Right then. So I guess we should get on to your questions. And actually, just to get the ball rolling, I've got a question here from Gavin Watson, one of our patrons. Thank you very much for patrons. 
it's wonderful having your support. I just want to say hello to Greece as well while we're at it. Fantastic, cool. So yeah, so the question from Gavin is, can you do some body repair stuff? He's planning on doing some small cosmetic bits to a Range Rover, bumper crack, paint scratches, all that kind of stuff. It'd be great to see me, or you, us, both yep. of us, you know, sort of carry out some repairs. And, and also, if we need to practice or do a demo on the channel, you know, we know where to go. So thanks, Gavin. It's never going to happen. The work we've got on our Range Rover is insane. Well, we've so. got some dents, haven't we? So uh, well, we, we have. We're going to take care of those. Well, we've got to keep, we've got to preserve some of the dents for John, but also we've got to repair all the rest of the bodywork. So we'll definitely do some yeah. more bodywork bits. Yeah. In fact, a friend of ours, Adam, yeah. as well, a friend of the show, is also very, very keen to do some other things other than mechanical yeah. stuff. It was what we promised right now. So, rust repairs first, bodywork last. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, yeah. of course. But also, yeah. we've got the boat. So we've actually got this composite boat. We've got the electric boat. And that needs a whole ton of bodywork. Because effectively, it is painted like a car, even though it obviously floats like a boat. Floats like a boat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you need to uh, swap it for a jet ski. Right, so what I'm doing, yes, well, well, we could do, I guess. I think it's quite a nice boat, to be fair. Now, I know what I need to do. I'm just going to work out where I can get some of these questions. So we've got a okay. question here from Emmeline McGill. Uh, oh, thanks, Peter Nichols. Hello, sir. Um, so the question for Emily McGill is, Hi Ed, I've seen that you're doing some work with Fuzz and Tim on the new series of Car SOS. Is this for one episode? Or do you have any plans to make this a more permanent arrangement? And what can you tell us about what you were doing? We won't tell them you told us. Well, that's a good question. Yes. Thank you for noticing. What, what have you been doing? I couldn't possibly say. Okay. No, no, it was good fun. We've had, we had some fun with the boys. And, I think um, the new series is coming out very soon, actually. Any second now. Obviously, if I was really organised, I would know exactly when the transmission yeah. date was. It's any minute now. It's very soon. Yes. And of course, if you're watching this video a month ago, it's already happened. It was brilliant. So, so yeah. we, I think we, we've done a few little bits and pieces. So we may be in more than one episode. Oh, part. okay. Well, yeah. I look forward to it. That'd be good fun. Yeah. So fantastic. Great question. Thank you, Emily. Now, let's have another look. What other questions have we got? Well, let's try and... I'm going to try and use this one here. Now, if I go... I want to do... I could do some clever stuff. We've got using a funky little app here. Oh, yeah, look at that, actually. So, it's Pliskin. Hi from Ukraine. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Hope things kind of tidy up a little bit. It's getting yeah, a bit messy, isn't it? Yeah, for you guys. Um, but I have another question here. So, uh, uh, hi, Barksha Sokal. Ciao, Denmark and Russia. I can't believe what that says at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Russia. Um, yes. So, where are we? So, hello from Switzerland. Hello from Turkey. Hello, Turkey. Hello from Scotland. This is fantastic. There are so many of you watching from all over the world. It's rather uh, wonderful. Brilliant. Isn't it? Thank you very much indeed. Now, let's have a look. Here we have another question here from Axel W. What is your take on the right to repair movement in the US, specifically around vehicles? Should manufacturers or dealerships be the only individuals with access to all streaming data coming off modern cars? Or should independent mechanics have access to it without paying ridiculous sums of money? It's a really yeah, good question. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a bit of an awkward question, isn't it, really? It kind of I depends. Mean, I think, obviously, if it's your car, why yeah, shouldn't you have car, access to your but data? What you don't want is your data getting into the wrong hands. That is true. Because all these cars now obviously start stop. No, you yeah. know, they haven't got any keys and everything else. Yeah. Cars can be taken, can't they? The dark forces on so the interweb could actually I maybe think, steal I your think if it can be placed in a way that only dedicated or, you know, proper people yeah. get the information, then I think it's probably a good thing. Are you a proper person? Well, I don't know. You <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, so I, think, I think if you're a mechanic, you can obviously give permission for your mechanic to actually work or yourself, in fact, on that, on that information. I think that would make a lot yeah. of sense. I mean, we're having the same problem over here, actually, in the UK. There is a movement now to actually try and stop sort of middling with cars. And obviously it's actually to try and stop a whole lot of other stuff going on. And obviously we've been very worried as a sort of enthusiast about where the line is going to be drawn. Yeah. It looks like at the moment we're going to be safe to carry on playing around with our hobby. But obviously, again, it's one of those things. It's just it's easier, you know, I think, for governments to control what's going on than just let yeah, well, us let's run just hope right. We can continue. Yeah. Otherwise, how on earth would we electrify classics for one thing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so exactly. that's a, a good question. Right, okay, another question here from Nick Harrison. Hi, Ed and Paul. Hi. Into classic minis. I keep catching a glimpse in the shots of the mini you have with the chopped roof. Is this a future build coming to the channel? I would certainly be interested in seeing this featured. Can you give me a little boy? Arthur, hello, Arthur. Hi, Arthur. See, I ask every week to see your videos. Well, thank you, Arthur. Sorry there's been a bit of a delay, but uh, hopefully you enjoy the shorts. But yeah. you should all go and rush. Yeah, what is the story with that mini? Well, it's a good question. Yes, I thought we were going to get across that. Okay. <laughs> no, well, so the Mini, um, it was basically as a sort of a friend's car. It was where Andy Saunders did a rooftop at a show once. Okay. And, and that was the result. He obviously did it very, very quickly. Yep. And I thought, well, now it's kind of like customised. Let's not say ruined. Let's say customised. Sorry, Andy. Okay, Modi um, modified. Modified. Yeah, and okay. now it's been modified. Uh, then I thought it'd be quite fun to take it a little bit further. And it occurred to me that it'd be quite cool to do an electric Mini. Of course, now BMW are now doing that. With yep. your classic Mini, they're offering that service, which is fun. Yep. But I thought, what we should do, because it's got a number plate of, I think it's 41 Fab or something, which obviously oh, we should do a Fab. We should plate. do a proper kind of Lady Penelope style 
three axle sort of mini, which okay. would be quite exciting, yeah. with a bubble top roof, so we'd have to worry about the roof that's been chopped. Yep. And then obviously have two electric motors in the front with two axles, so it'd be super cool. Now obviously, I did have plans of quickly getting that done last series, and then quickly getting it done yeah, from I the last of the we just run out of time. Yeah, so it might happen one day, we will get onto it, okay. but um, it's obviously going to be a lot of welding and grinding and stuff, so I think so our partners BOC are going to help us with that, obviously, and then Thank there's going to be tons of work, and then we're going to need, obviously, lots of glass to make the bubble top look cool, and we're going to need a lot of time. So once John's right. Range Rover is sorted, I keep looking down there because that is actually no, where it is. It's down there. Yeah. <laughs> In a pile of rubbish. Down there. And we'll, uh, yes, we'll, we'll crack on with that, which is very, very exciting. Wowzers, it's fantastic. There are some, hello from Montreal, yes, that's wonderful. Montreal, Canada. Lovely. Great to see us back, thank you very much. Captain Tom 14. Wowzers. Oh, hang on, this is a funny one as well. So, from Coleman, get Project Binky on the show, maybe. Well, yeah. yes. Well, obviously, it's about time they came and swept our floor, frankly, because I did that same service for them. You but yes, did. we'd love to have the guys, and we've obviously already been making most of their cardboard aided design when we're playing around with our orange car. So, yeah. definitely, yes, Nick and Rich will be coming down here any minute now. Wowzers, there are so many countries. So, hello, Hungary, Algiers, Holland, Lithuania, Arizona, Missouri. They're not entirely countries, but that's okay. Canada, Sweden, Serbia, Ecuador, and Finland. This is fantastic. Thank you all for watching. Thank you very much indeed. All right, let's find another question. Okay, we have one here from Paul Smith. Hi, guys. When a car is being restored and all the rusty panels have been cleaned up and the new patches welded in, the panels are all grounded and sanded and everything looks new again. My question is, if you were to look behind the panels, would you just see all the backs of the welds or do they get cleaned up properly as well? I've always had a picture in my mind of a nicely restored car that looks fantastic from the outside, but a right mess under its skin. Now, that is a fantastic question. Yeah, well, we always try, don't we? So if, we, if we're doing a patch panel, say, on an A-pillar, mm. When we cut it out, we always try and before we weld the new panel in, we always try to treat it first inside. Yeah. You know, we'd like some zinc spray or something just to obviously seal it. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously we then weld on top of it after. But the tricky thing, I mean, it depends on how good your welding is for yeah. one thing, because obviously if you get the penetration mm. just right, there will be this nice little cute little bump on the back of the weld. But obviously if it blows through or whatever, you're going to end up with little sticks of weld in there. And of course, you can never get in there again. So it's a fair question. Probably on some repairs, you're going to end up with a slightly nasty looking inside, which of course does potentially mean that it's going to rust again. Yeah. But equally, I guess on some of the bigger panels or when, you know, maybe when you can get access, you can do some of that tidying up beforehand. And it really just comes down to just really, really awesome welding technique. Yeah. I mean, you're TIG good, welding. You're good at welding, aren't you? I'm getting the hang of it yeah, now after yeah, a while. Yeah. But, you know, I stick stuff together. Sometimes it looks pretty, sometimes it's. No, also. I think you do a fair job. Thank you. Yeah. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> That's okay. It's my pleasure. But great question. Thank you very much, Paul. Now, um, oh, hang on. I've just lost the other next question. So the next question is from David Trainer. His question is How many items of clothes do you get through as the. Um, I can't worry. The, the double t shirt combat always looks sparkling at the start of an episode, but less so at the end. Well, he's got to be real, hasn't it? And also, how do you cope with all the innuendo? Eduendo, actually. And obviously, we put it in there because of your enjoyment and your drinking games, frankly, because they're good fun. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Right. So, well, the thing is, obviously, the, 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 the sort of the double t shirt look thing, I guess, started a long time ago because I needed to look baggy. Back when I was. Svelte, should we say, it's an idea, rather than completely over full size. Um, you know, back in the day, well, that must have been what, twenty odd years ago now. Um, I looked, I looked wrong on camera. I just sort of, I didn't, it didn't look quite normal. So obviously, by bagging up me, my clothes, yeah. as it were, adding a few extra layers, made all the difference. And then it just became a thing. And then obviously, now it's just legendary. It's just normal, isn't it? Yeah, even go, yeah. Bang Goes the Theory. I don't know, what were they called? The, the Big Bang Theory, whatever it was. Even they, Sheldon, had to look like me because he yeah. was the coolest kid in town, obviously. That's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> What a load of rubbish. Yes, no, so exactly that. So yeah, but we do go through quite a few bits. Obviously, we kind of make a lot of T-shirts. We have lots available in the store immediately right now. Well, no, a little so, plug there. Of course. Get that in there. Uh, and for that matter, of course, the mugs, which are full of coffee right now. Which is yeah. Mm. yeah. Which is great. So And my book. There are all kinds of stuff. Go to the store, buy some stuff. So it's, uh, yes, edchina.com slash uh, edgear. So... Yeah, basically, obviously, we do wear all that kind of stuff, but also we try and be a bit ironic sometimes. I mean, back in the day when we were doing, you know, wheeler dealers and stuff, we used to wear, especially for the test drive, clothes that would kind of match the situation. Haven't done too much stuff outside of here, but we'll get there. You know, we're playing with the music first, then we play with the clothing later. I used to just wear overalls. You always used to wear overalls. I never yeah. did. Well, well, I didn't go out on test drives. Yeah. Well, actually, I did, but I was behind the scenes. So. Usually with the trailer behind. Yeah, there was a trailer and the van and the tools. And, yeah. Well, how else yeah. would you magically appear from nowhere? That's exactly, a very good question. Yeah. But there we are. Well, thank you, David. Exactly that. Yes, thank so you, we do go through a lot of clothes, but also a lot of washing. So that's good. 
Um, another question here from Danny C. Great to have you back, Ed. Hope the boilers all sort of luck. <laughs> question, yes. So when we got yeah. back from Norway, fantastic. Having driven all the way through Europe, we actually ended up finding out that we had no heating in our house. And I haven't actually sorted it out yet, but we have kind of come up with a temporary fix, which should be fine. Had to make the show. Um, anyway, the question is, which car window dealers was the most difficult to find parts for, and how did you overcome this? If you do have the chance to answer my question, thank you. You're very welcome. Keep up the great work. Yeah. We will. Yes. The hardest car... To find parts for well i think i think probably the cadillac mm -hmm. was a hard car to get the parts for that was um, cool so that was the one with the massive wings wonderful per apple yep. sort of uh, paint yeah and then simon's brilliant pinstriping yeah. and then another one was probably the amphi car that was really hard to get parts for yeah it was really hard to get bodywork yeah. well, because was, that was, that yeah. was just, it was riddled with holes it was just horrible yeah. it was a horrible car but anyway i'll tell you what no no i tell you what the uh, the polish um oh fso serena, serena. Yeah. yeah serena um, Serena, Serena. Yeah, that, that was a, that was another hard car. Wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, because let's face it, they only made them in Poland. Yeah. So, so, so that was really tough to get hold of. Luckily, most of the bits were there. It always seemed like they were slightly in the wrong order because the yeah. radiator was behind the engine. But that's a whole other story. That was one of the lovely quirks. Yeah. Yes, that was, that was hard. Tricky. It was hard. I mean, I was, well, actually, also, I tell you what, the Cadillacs, the 1916 Cadillac we did in America, that was obviously like. But when we got it, it was just a load of rusty bits and pieces. So yeah. that was a bit of a mare. And I think you know, till we ended up needing a spare engine and an axle and wheels to actually get and to you, go you to actually Vicky's bought Paris. another car didn't well we you? had to it's like, I was yeah. thinking at the time it's like where on earth Don't do you car. find parts yeah. for a hundred year old car it's like well off another hundred year old car so, so you, you buy another car yeah. and then yeah and we have got them in the workshop now, which is fantastic, and we will do some more work on those. The first thing, I think, is on the 1918 Cadillac, so the one we actually had to buy for the bits. The, 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 the prime part, what makes it so special, is it's one of the first cars with the electric start, and that is not working. So it no longer is one of the first cars with electric start, so, we so need I'll a, fix that. So we need to sort yeah. starter. So that job yeah. will be coming okay. up any minute now. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Danny, for that question. Thank you. All right, another question here from Digital Gorilla. Um, I was only thinking this afternoon whilst watching an update from Colin Furs. I haven't seen my other favourite mad scientist, well engineer, then for a while. I hope he's okay. Yes, we are. We're fantastic. So the question is, would we consider making something weird and wacky with Colin? Absolutely. We actually first met Colin, oh, probably just under a million years ago, or certainly oh, 11 done. million subscribers ago. Um, and uh, we were doing a Guinness World Record with the bathroom bike. So we were doing the world's fastest bathroom. He had the world's fastest uh, mobility scooter. And we had a race in central London somewhere in oh, the ben Canary Wharf. And it was fantastic. Obviously, Colin being Colin in his punk ways, yeah. obviously managed to crash into the press, okay. past the con cones went everywhere. It was fantastic fun. So that was great. But yes, love to do some stuff with Colin. And you never know, maybe if we get to our million subscribers, maybe we should do something special with Colin. Yeah, Colin, very, if you're up for yeah, it. We're very close, aren't we? Yeah, it'd be yeah. quite a good idea. Okay, well, we'll see what Colin has to say about that. Give him a hard time about it though, definitely. <laughs> and subscribe so we get to a million. And then click notification or your bell so you get notifications. And like and comment as you have been, which is wonderful. In fact, we should Thank take you. another little comment from over here. Greetings from Mallorca. Hello, Mallorca. Um, oh, hang on, there's one here from Sal R. Oh, I'll just move you over there a little bit. So, hey, Ed, my FJ Cruiser needs power steering fluid. The manual says use Dextron ATF. Factory fluid is, is clear. What do I add? That's a good Ooh. question. I would argue that you go with what the uh, manual says, partly because obviously you don't know who's had the vehicle before. You don't know even if it's been when it's been serviced. Whether no, so they could have the wrong. It could. So yeah. Way. So don't yeah. ever go with, the, with necessarily assume that what's in the car right now is okay. But I would definitely go with what they say to. But then also, like we did with um, Adam's Mustang, which is just behind us. If you go that way a little bit <laughs> and then they can come back again yes then with the mustang obviously when we did that we actually went for sort of an aftermarket product that has all the same specifications that's really the thing with all oils basically they're, they're they're kind of there are good ones and there are bad ones but obviously all modern oils have to fit a certain number of specifications so as long as you get that bit right yeah. then you should um, be okay. and was that the mineral base wasn't it that one i think it probably was yeah. actually yes and it just obviously needs to have certain additives so power steering is obviously slightly different to power steering fluid is often slightly different to um transmission fluid and it's often to do with thickness and things so yeah. yeah so just make sure that it sort of matches the spec you're supposed to have but good question thank you very much thank you this is very exciting isn't it we have some more hellos from here hello israel siberia madrid idaho kosovo usa latvia ukraine idaho. turkey swansea malta reunion island that's fantastic um, germany serbia mexico salford and manchester new zealand basque country in spain um, or was that separate to Spain? But saying hello anyway. Uh, hello, Croydon, everybody. Uh, Shepparton, South Africa, and Lithuania. This is amazing. It is amazing. Watching. Fantastic. It's so good. Good time to pick that one. So now, is there a question here from nobody else yet? So it's just <laughs> um, Albert Einstein is saying his tailor is rich. 
Okay, I did that rich from bad obsession, okay. or he's just minted because you spend so much money on stuff? Don't know. Um, um, we're finally back. Yes, we are finally back. And I just lost your... That was from Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. <coughs> and um, hi, lads. Hope you'll finish. I missed that one. <laughs> this is the point. I hope you finish the land But Yes, so do we. Actually, to be honest, we were trying to work out planning the show, trying to plan the episodes. And so far, I've got at least 25 more episodes to try and get that thing finished. But I, then, think, I think it's going to be more than 25 episodes. <laughs> it's going to be loads more. Because yeah, one of those episodes was build engine. So I think, to be honest... You know, Are we going to get the engine built in one episode? Not a chance. So Maybe clearly it's going to be more like 30 yeah. or 50 episodes, which means that then it's probably going to be a number of years. So we may well be chasing the tails well, of, of, of the boys. I think by the time we finish that, I'll have my bus pass, I think. <laughs> we could do a bus. Do and that's another thing to do oh. with Fuzz, actually, from SOS. Yeah. Buzz likes buses, doesn't he? He does. He's, oh, yeah. I can see another plan coming. But we've, I actually always, always, always wanted a route master. Well, no, I, I tried to buy a route master many, many years ago as a student because yeah. I thought it'd be brilliant student accommodation. But just at the point where they went through the roof yeah. the prices because they all kind of kind of coming out of all the various sort of um, London bus companies, and I ended up with a Leyland Atlantean from the Ribble Valley yeah. in Yorkshire. Yeah. And well, it was good because it had slightly taller ceilings, which means I didn't have to kind of lie on the floor to walk around. Yeah, I wouldn't have that trouble. No, indeed. Yeah. So, route master would suit you very well. But, but no, I do. I just they're classic, aren't they? Yeah. Just, you'd yeah. have to have a long wheelbase one. Yeah, yeah. So if you notice, if you look on a route master bus. They have a number of windows on the side. Okay. They're kind of long TV style, 16 by 9 size windows. But there's a little square one in the middle. And if there is a square one in the middle, then okay. that means it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight seats, I think, extra. Okay. Or maybe it's even 10 seats extra. And um, yeah, so it's very, very exciting. So I'm looking over here because I'm getting messages as well. So this is Neil Burgess. Hello. Hello, Neil. Hertfordshire. Hello, Neil. <laughs> what are you doing doing this rather than doing some work? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> how's, that, how's that mini? Oh yeah, well all of his minis, he's got thousands now, yeah. they keep growing, that's the problem, once you get a little workshop and you put a load of minis in there, they just kind of multiply. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's guess... Neil of the Rally Mini, which was where the Mustang was, and thank goodness we actually managed to get it to go again. I think the great. Mustang's been there longer than the Mini now, hasn't it? It has, yeah, it's already it's, started it's, rusting, yeah, sorry Adam, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we are going to paint it satin black, don't you worry, because yeah. he'd love that. So anyway, moving on. <laughs> Oh, no, I missed that. I'll move on but very, very quickly. Hello from Clearwater, Florida. Oh, hang on. Um, well, hello, Clearwater, Florida. I've got to hello, have to get Clearwater. this right. <laughs> I've been there many times. Um, do you miss the motorised sofa from Paul Attrell? Thank you, Ralph. I'm just going to drag you and put you there just so you can see. Hello, Paul. Um, yes, now, I think that's a good question. I am kind of missing that, to be honest. At the moment, it's still stuck in California because, obviously, we drove it uh, to SEMA from LA, which was quite good fun, and did a little bit of filming with Jay Lanham after a small fire, yep. as you do, yep. and then another epic journey up to San Francisco and back. And, and then we basically kind of ran out of time. We were going to go back and do some more filming, and then there was a little tiny issue with a little tiny, you know, virusy thing. Um, and, um, I suppose, uh, obviously, being really hot out in the, in the desert doesn't help, does it? Well, it's not. Well, it's, it's not that hot. What do you mean? As in, doesn't help the well, virus? No, no hot. hot. As in temperature. Yeah, it's pretty hot, isn't it? In Las Vegas, it is. Yeah. So obviously, unless it snows and it's cold. Yeah. yeah. But it's pretty hot all yeah. the time, isn't it? No, it's so. cool. But no, it's good yeah. fun. Actually. Well, we did it in the winter. Obviously, did it in November. So actually, it was a fantastic drive, and it's yeah. an amazing way to go. The main thing was driving down Highway One. You know, sort of to Big Sur and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely epic, oh, epic yeah, drive. No, but yes, I, we'll get it yeah. back, or might even build another one. Because hey, you can't have too many driving sofas in the world, can well, you? We may leave it there and then just build another one. Well, we'll get it back. But in yeah. the meantime, what if it takes me too long to get back to the states? So we could do that. Yeah. So yeah, watch this space. We have still quite a lot of jobs to do. In fact, we have a shopping trolley, a giant shopping trolley you've seen in the back of the studio. I think probably we should do that first before we go on yeah, the Yeah, because we've had that ages now. Forever. Yeah. yeah, that was mad. So now let's have a look. Are we doing more questions from this end? No. Okay, so thanks to Stephen Petty, Alan Harrison, Wishbone, JY and Fernandez. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And, um, <laughs> so this is a little question here from well comment really so Leo Brent so bad it took Ed so long to realise that YouTube was his perfect place for his own show yeah well you know it's funny actually we got onto YouTube just as a, almost as like an accident and then for a, a number of years we had about 7,000 people waiting for something to happen and here it is so thank you for waiting it's very very good of you <laughs> um, oh here we go what's the one over here so this is one from Thomas okay that's Thomas Cock so Will we see you in the orange on the mini London Brighton this year? Now, that's a good point. When is the London Brighton this year? Is it May? Probably usually is sometime in May. So that'd be quite cool. Well, we, we now it's actually steering straight. Now it drives nicely. Now there's no fuel smell. Yep. It would be quite cool. So we've got a little bit of paperwork to do to get it back on the road. I think you might there's see us possibility. there. possibility. I think it's a much, much stronger bet than the Lady Penelope mini that is in the... Uh, no, definitely, yeah. <laughs> that's a great question. How long have I known Paul? This is a question from... Darren Hankinson. Mm. Oh, I didn't see that one. What was that one? Sorry, is that? 
Oh, it's for Paul. Okay. It's a question for Paul. No, it's a hi. Oh, it's a hi. Oh, hi. Well, say hi to who? Hang on. <laughs> so it's Henning. Yes. Henning. Oh, Henning. Yeah. Fantastic. So, well, how long have we known each other? Well, we did uh, actually talk about this on episode... Yeah, yeah, we did. Episode, episode... It's, I can tell you, it's 25 it's years. <laughs> 97. He's yeah, very good so with years and yeah. motorway junctions. Yeah, yeah. I'm very sad. <laughs> so yeah, 97, so that's 25 years. Yeah. So well, those of you who haven't bothered to watch the video, <laughs> we did on, I can't even remember what episode it was, but we did one where we see Paul's yellow van and there's me waving at him. So basically, um, look who's here or something. Um, we, I was, I was working on a, a Volkswagen van, a Type 25, which is the kind of wedgy thing as for the Australians, I yeah. guess, um, that kind of shape. And um, I had put all kinds of things. I'd put in an Alfa Romeo engine. I'd put in sort of other bits and pieces. Yeah, and, and, then and, and then you put a Rover V8 put engine. A Rover V8 yeah, engine. Yeah, and yeah. the problem with that is they do stick out the back, so I'd lowered it by about four inches. So I could push it forward four inches without ruining the CV joints. All very complicated. Yeah. But the thing is, to get it to actually fit inside that space, I needed a really small. There's like an early type sort of P5 distributor, and it's very hard to get hold of them. And I I went to a shop, I'd pull my hair out, I've been to all kinds of stores, and in the end, the last one I could think of, he went, no, no, we haven't got anything, but they should try the chap around the corner. He's very nice, apparently. I didn't believe that for of a second. Of course he's nice. And then, and then, then he was there working on his drag car, so you had, a, is that a TR7, but actually with a V8 in it? Yes, it was a, yeah, TR. Well, yeah, Ferrari yeah, yeah, yellow, yeah, t- I think yeah, it was. Yeah, Jello Fly, Jello I think it's the colour. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah so. And you came around, didn't you? And I did. I, and I gave you a distributor. He did, yeah. and it was rubbish. I put it in, and because well, he was doing his drag that's... racing, he'd actually welded up the bob weights, which meant that he didn't actually change the timing. So, of course, it obviously bogged down horribly. Um, and so I took it back to get my money back, and then he helped me fix it. And yeah, then, well, the reason then... I welded it up, obviously, because I ran an MSD. Yeah. And the MSD does all the management. Yeah. It's hardly it for me, so... He didn't tell me that, did he? Well, I do apologize. Yeah. <laughs> but he never got to escape since then. So no, no, and that was yeah. it. That's yeah. fantastic. So, good question. Thank you. Thank you very much to Savage Media. Years. 25 years, it's shocking, isn't it? So Savage Media are rebuilding the Land Rover 101 with a diesel conversion Volvo in 11 weeks. That's just showing off. Yeah, that's not too bad, is it? It took me 11 weeks to think about what I was going to do to John's Range Rover. In fact, yeah. it took us even longer than 11 weeks just to get it to the MOT station to see what it was going to fail on. So well done. That's fantastic. Right, now, I think that one's... We run out of that screen. So what other screens have we got here? So... Um, is a little question. Oh, hang on. If I put that question up there and take that question away, <laughs> it's very exciting, this, isn't it? Gentinus Pepage. Um, Ed, my car doesn't break. What do I need to do with it? Well, I would oh. say not drive it for a while until you fix that problem. Um, the, fir- the most obvious thing, depending on what the car is, how old the car is, more info would be helpful. But and when you think about that, I guess the first thing is obviously brake fluid is hygroscopic, which means it absorbs moisture from the atmosphere. Yep. So if you haven't changed your brake fluid for, I don't know, two, three years, then what can happen is it goes all bit spongy, which would obviously stop the braking. But, but obviously the first thing, check to make sure you've actually got brake fluid in it. Yes, that would be a very good you point. Know, and obviously if it's not a nice kind of lovely golden colour, then probably there might be an issue. And if, Normally, you, and if you haven't got any brake fluid in it, find out where it's gone. Well, that's the other thing. Yes, yes, it should obviously be in space. And if it isn't in the in in the, in the reservoir, then obviously yes, you've got an issue. So the next thing to do is take your wheels off, um, and then go around and then just see if you can see any moisture. Because obviously, normally moisture on the wheels is either other from puddles, is obviously going to be either from the shock absorber leaking or normally yeah. from the brake system leaking. So that would be the next thing to try. But also, if you've got a trolley jack and you know those axle stands, you could jack up one side at a time, and then actually then spin the wheels and try the brakes to see if any obvious one doesn't work. That'd be another yeah. thing to try. Yeah, that's so really just thinking just go through the process trying to work out what's wrong you yeah. know, what isn't quite correct and obviously, older cars obviously rusty brake pipes yeah that could That's be another thing, thing yep. obviously the flexies can break down as well we had a problem years and years and years ago on an old camper van where everything seemed fine but it turned out that the brake pipe had actually broken down on the inside so when you push the brake a little bit of rubber kind of broke off the inside and kind of wedged itself so you got really really good pedal but obviously nothing was actually getting yep. to the slave cylinder so yep. that was another classic yeah so good luck with that problem fantastic thank you for the question thank you and there's, well, thank you very much, Alan Harrison. You're restoring a 1979 Porsche 928. Any tips? Taking him 10 years to restore that so far. Yes. Well, well take, do it quicker. That'd be the first tip. Yeah. Um, so, well, that's a great car. Yeah, lovely car, isn't it? 928. I think, well, I, well totally, when we did ours all those years ago, uh, that was that wonderful brown colour. It was fantastic. Proper 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, brown. It was, um, was it 78 yeah. or something? 
it was, yeah, yeah, I think it was. Well, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so it was a great car. What I, what I found with that is it was a really lovely car to take apart. There are some cars that really, really fight you. There are some cars that just fall apart in your hands. They kind of turn to dust. But everything but I did, didn't it? That was amazing. And everything just worked nicely. Yeah. And, and even the stuff, I don't remember what we actually had to fix. I mean, we had to paint it. And I think... Yeah, I don't actually remember what we did. <laughs> I know we re-sprayed it. Yes, that was. But about, we I must have done some mechanics. I, I remember fiddling it. with the lights. Was it? Was it a light? I know we changed things? the wheels. Do you remember? That's not, why was I playing with the light switches? I don't know, but we def definitely <laughs> well made the pop up headlights maybe. And maybe that's what it was. Maybe that yeah, was. Like, yeah. But we definitely changed the wheels on it. Yeah. I remember doing that. But I think I think the thing with that car is obviously again try and use OEM bits and pieces if you can find them. I don't know how many sort of un OEM parts are going to be available for that, and I guess there will be a fair few in breakers maybe yeah. still, but maybe not. I but imagine I mean, you know Porsche still stock yeah. old but parts it, but it's going to last yeah. I mean the thing is it's, it's, it's a great car it's a fantastic engine it sounds wonderful um, and actually got some room in it as well which makes yeah. change. so very good yeah, yes good question right now um, uh, let's have another look up here so hello to Sardina Sardinia I should say hello Master Steel um, and somebody a number has missed our show so it's back so that's fine thank you for missing it um, so <laughs> Let's have another look. So I, I've managed to stop the feed, which is quite exciting. So <laughs> now, hang on, where we go? So oh, here we are. So from Rebellious Rainbow Unicorn, Land Rover could make a new world record for the number of YouTube videos on one car repair. Well, Binky are smashing that, aren't they? I think. I mean, that's going to be. But you're right. We could give it a go. There must be. There must be a record for that. And maybe I yeah, mean, I already know. pretty much got the world record for the worst failure for AMT ever. Yeah. But um, it's four pages. And another hello to Deeper Image Automotive. We'd love to see our work on McLaren on McLaren RC, as in. Hmm? Oh, is that a radio controlled? I'm well, not sure. RC. So hydraulic RC. suspension. Hang on, I'll read the rest. So we've got various bits and pieces: hydraulic suspension, actuators. Oh yes, it's, it's probably the real thing. Accumulators, cam phasers. That sounds very exciting, and lots of electronics. That would be a mental car, actually. I know we've had the privilege of going to see the McLaren sort of world if you yeah. like and it is a number of times actually it is a wonderful wonderful place it's lovely place. very very high tech and i know that obviously the older ones some of the f1s they have a couple of little weird foibles with things because it's something yep. to do with security was you had to do something with the windscreen wiper arm or something was it to turn it off or i don't know it's almost like one of those saabs with the okay. funny key yep. thing. anyway there's issues with those so i think it's one of those cars that you probably want to get a little bit of expert advice but yeah it'd be fun to have on the show um thanks to michael mcgee hello I think. Hello. Um, so yes, let's have another little look over here. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that. That's for sure. Um, oh, here we go. There's another sort of question. I'm going to give this question to Paul. It's quite exciting. Okay. But I will butt in. So from Dave Abernathy. So Ricky Parab, what is an EGR in a diesel engine? So it's an EGR exhaust engine. gas recirculation valve. Yeah. Basically, so so what so, what happens is well you're gone. Go. Yeah, so it recirculates the exhaust gases <laughs> through a filter. <laughs> and if you haven't guessed that from the so, description, yeah, well, really. and obviously, yeah, they, they they break, things go wrong with them. Well, the main thing, well, basically, what it yeah. is is obviously it's, it's, to do, it's to do with trying to make diesel engines kind of cleaner in the environment, yeah. trying to get rid of all those particles, those and nasty stuff. things. Yeah, I and, think and my van hasn't got one because it's pre EGR. Oh wow! So it's got yeah. just got cats and stuff, um, and converters. So that's the thing. And obviously now, I guess obviously with things like AdBlue and all this kind of stuff, and obviously that's trying to get rid of that. So the thing about them out is that if they if they don't um, if you don't sort of clean them out of the engine, there should be sort of various bits for the, like the regen and whatever. So they, they all this stuff, like the DPF filters, they all need to be kind of cleaned through with the soot. So if you don't go on really really long journeys or live fast journeys, at least to get your engine up to temperature and give it a good blast, then basically that soot can build up and then they get a bit clogged and then the engine management takes over and starts yep. stopping you from driving. Yeah. So so first of all, obviously when you get on, get, get yourself on a little journey every once in a while, you know, sort of drive up the motorway and just sort of even like 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever, you know, sort of do 70, 80 miles an hour, 70 yeah, miles an hour, do the it, speed limit. Yeah, in, a do lower, in a lower but, gear. Yeah, keep exactly, just to keep the ribs nice yeah. and high, and that's going to get everything nice and warmed up, and eventually then it's going to do the regen, it's going to get rid of all of that soot, and everything's okay. But if it's gone too far, there's a couple of players you can do it. You can actually obviously take everything apart and remove it and then replace them. You can sometimes clear it. There are lots of nasty chemicals you can use to kind of dissolve all that soot, and sometimes you can actually do that. You can yep. get magical foams that you sort of pour into the system, and they kind of dissolve that as well. Yep. So there's a number of different solutions, and there are a number of garages that will actually offer those solutions. It won't necessarily be as expensive to clean it as it would be to replace it. Good um, question. 
thanks to JY, inspire them to get masters in manufacturing engineering. Well, fantastic. I hope that works out for you. Don't come looking for a job if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't manufacture anything here. That'd be fine. And what an exciting time to be just actually learning that subject because obviously with 3D printing of sort of metals, glass, plastics, I mean, it's an amazing time to be Oh, technology is just so advanced now, isn't it? It's just it really incredible. And obviously stuff like graphene, I'm sure by the time, you know, sort of your fully qualified graphene will be a thing that'll be very easy to use, very, very exciting kind of molecule thick. Yeah. Yeah. bit of carbon which will be i'm sure we're going to see on car bodies before too long solar oh. panels all that kind of stuff so very definitely cool. solar panels fantastic right now um okay so i'm just going to keep we have all these little comments on the side here so hello costa rica hello costa rica Richard, there that's fantastic and um some stuff in cyrillic hello <laughs> alex <laughs> um now, I'm looking for a question down here. In fact, actually, if you've got any questions, I probably should have mentioned this a little bit earlier than this. You can always chuck a little cue into your text, and then that way I can actually then find it possibly more easily, even though I'm not entirely searching for it. We've got another thanks to Fernando Fernandez for recommendations to build a Defender with an LS7 engine. Oh, wow. LS7, yeah. That would be cool. I will, first thing, I think. Obviously, it's all going to be about wiring with that. So, so with the Defender, I guess, depending on what year you're looking at. Yeah, but you get a harness. You can buy a harness. Well, you can, but obviously, when, I suppose, what year, when, when would they start playing around with CAN bus and all that kind of stuff on the Defender? Would that oh, be an issue? Quite, quite late. So, it? the thing about it is, yeah. so, so I think while it's still, you know, actually, you know, got its original engine in, if it's still working or whatever, is while you still got everything connected up, I think one of the things we're going to actually look at doing that on one of the many Range Rovers I have that don't work. But the idea would be to actually get yourself a CAN bus reader and, and then actually sort of get the car working and, and then you can get some quite clever apps these days where you can actually sort of assign sort of, I guess, functions to various yeah. CAN signals and then you can work out what's the throttle, what does the power steering, all this kind of stuff. And the better map you can make at the beginning, the easier your job's going to be a bit later on because you're going to have to probably put in some kind of CAN emulator to trick mm. the car into thinking that everything's okay and it hasn't lost its engine. So that's probably the biggest challenge with that. Obviously, as you say, you can get a wiring room to go with the LS7, yeah. um, but it'd be fantastically much more reliable oh, probably, yeah. Yeah, way probably more powerful. Yeah. So that's a fantastic yeah. idea. Yeah, I've got you. no idea if it would fit. I'm sure, it, I'm sure it's fine. Loads of room. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Think, and yeah. yeah, send us some pickies when you've actually got, yeah. you know, yeah. halfway at least. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Hello, Japan. Hello, Japan. And hola, Argentina. Argentina. And hello, Dartmoor. Dartmoor. <laughs> right, let's keep going. Right, so we have some more questions here. Please read messages. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. I'm going to put that over there. Hello, Gentonis. I've read Hello. your message. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you had a question there somewhere else as well. Will we see at the NEC at Mar in March? There you go. That's a question Ooh. from Malcolm Frith. I actually think we're going to be so knee deep into into yeah, workshop diaries, we're not going to be able to get it. there actually, unfortunately. Because we have a lot to do. Obviously, you've got a lot of catching up to do. We've got a lot of Range Rovering to do, and all the other things that are going to go on as well. So, if you're going to go, have a great time. Yeah, we enjoy might yourself. See you there. Okay, another question down here. So, can we recommend? Oh, let's have a look here. So, from Kagan. Can you recommend a book about making setup, especially for racing cars? Yes, there is. Uh, oh, now there's a book by Colin Chapman, and it's yellow. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the time. But if you go, if it's something like you know, Amazon or you know, I'm sure there are lots of other book websites where you can actually find this kind of stuff. There's probably three or four. If I can think about it, I'll try and put them in the description, um, actually, of this video a bit later on. But essentially, there's a couple of really great ones just to help you get the grounding in understanding uh, and understanding suspension because that really is the thing. It, obviously. The car without the suspension working is going to be nothing. No. But it, there are lots of books about how to sort of start your process with a racing car. Obviously, it's all about balance. It's all about having control. And so, you know, the first thing when you're building a car is working out all the bits you need, including yourself, yep. fuel tanks, all that kind of stuff. Whether it's electric, whether it's petrol, diesel, whatever. And then it's about weight distribution because you want that to be as kind of neutral as possible. And then once you've managed to achieve that in the building of the vehicle, then you want to make that respond as well as possible by messing around with suspension. So when we did the Mini Neil's Rally Mini, obviously that gave you a bit. Of an insight into how to set up the suspension yep. and some of the issues but when it comes to building the car really it takes a lot of sort of scratching of head probably lots of note taking but it's essentially the, the simplest form is yeah get your car strip off everything you don't need put everything yep. in you do need things like roll cages which of course you can't really adjust afterwards and then things like batteries and fuel tanks and whatever else you can then kind of put in the right position to taste to make sure that the car is as neutral as possible yeah and then obviously corner weights Yes, afterwards, once, yeah. you, once, you, once you've got it, is, is, well, I think the, the key That's thing... That's more in a setting up point, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, the key thing is that you, you can't 
remove a ton of errors or, or discrepancies for when you're setting up the corner weights. Basically, that's just to do the best you can with yep. the setting you've yep. got. Where all the work is, is actually building the car in the first place. So yep. get yourself a, some corner weight scales if you can, and then that way when you're sort of fixing stuff, welding stuff in, bolting stuff, you know, fire extinguishers, all that kind of stuff, then you can know, you can sort of check live, if you like, where's the right place to put it. Yep. Good luck with that and yeah, happy good racing. <laughs> Hello to Cyprus, and Hello, Carl Shulton and Kentucky. Well, what is our the question from Kentucky? Is what's our favourite straight six? Our oh, favourite straight six. I have, I have to say it's not a long list because I'm trying to think of actually yeah, I mean, how many well, we've got. Well, we, we, did, we did the uh, the Chevy truck that we got, got in San Francisco. Cool. Yeah, that yeah, was nice. That had a straight six in it. Do you remember? That was good. And I guess they um, Jaguar do one. That was all yeah, right, Jaguar did a straight six. That was kind of groovy. We, yeah, that was yeah, and that was in the Mark II, wasn't it? Can I lose a cylinder yeah. and call it a five? Because obviously the Audi um, five pot was an amazing engine. It was yeah, so good they really. stopped making it for no particular reason at all. Well, but, they still um, they still do it now. It's Audi still make a five cylinder engine. Yeah, but the good one for the coupe yeah, they did. Yeah. So yeah. yes, good question. And hello, India, Australia, Sheffield again, Cologne, Netherlands, Germany, and Poland. Hello, fantastic. Thank you for watching. Thank you. We should watch some more of these comments. Hang on, I'm going to go new. Oh, we've got a queue. I'm going to search for a queue. Here we go. <laughs> It's so high tech over here, it's amazing. Um, I need to do the whole ad comment thing. Anyway, I think we've got some. Here we go. So, if I pop that. Um, oh, hello. Interesting. Hello. So this is from Rachel. Hello, Rachel. So, hi, chaps. Hi, Any chap. chance of getting Damien Maguire on with his electric converted land job BMW? Um, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, well, because, I mean, you know, it's. It, Electric conversions for classic cars are definitely sort of part of the future. It'd be really cool to actually have him on and see what he's done. I actually haven't followed recently to see kind of where he's up to. So it'd be quite interesting to yeah, have a go with that. Yeah, yeah really cool. good. I'll make a note of that, someone. <laughs> and then we'll have a chat. That'd be rather brilliant. Um, and um, John is with us. Hello, John. Hi, John. <laughs> As in John Rain Driver, John is with us. He's yeah. actually bothering well, to watch. It's very good. Thank you, John, for watching. Yeah, and we haven't forgotten. And it's all your fault that we're doing this live and not actually doing it pre-recorded. Well, yeah. not all entirely your fault. It's obviously the thought of your car. There we go. It's good. This is good fun, isn't it? It's quite exciting. Right, another little question here. So, um, hang on. Oh yeah, now this is a good question. Sorry, I know I'm having to think and read at the same time. It doesn't work. So, Kieran Hewins here. So, after all of our deals of returning from Norway with electricity. And you mentioned every building having their own supply. Would you ever consider solar PV and battery storage at the workshop? Absolutely. In fact, it's funny how your question, Good question. is so upside. Basically, last year, our plan was we were working with uh, an insulation panel. That's why we're wearing coats, frankly. That's why we have our gloves here, just in case yeah, it gets really, really cold. Uh, the temperature is yeah, dropping. Heated jacket. Speak. But the idea was to get some insulated panels. And there was a product where you could actually have some solar PV attached to that. And the idea is we were going to cover the entire building. Apparently, we have enough solar PV to charge up a thousand Nissan Leafs a year wow. from average UK sun, which would be very exciting. But obviously, the thing with that is you're making tons and tons of energy. Where does it go when you actually, you know, so you can't just pump it back into the grid. So obviously, we wanted to put a load of batteries on either side of the building so we could store that energy. But then, once those batteries are full, obviously, the next problem would be what do you do with that spare electricity? I thought, well, then we could make some hydrogen. And then, obviously, we could power either do some heating with hydrogen or even power a hydrogen car that we're yet to build, but that will come. Um, with that, so that's a great idea. Absolutely love that. If you've got a load of insulated panels and a load of solar panel question coming up here, probably. Oh, hello. It's an image from Paul. It's an image from Paul Wooding. Rates prep book. Oh, that's, thank you very much. Now, where did that go? Hang on. I'm not quite sure where the question went or the picture went. Um, <laughs> we'll find that later. I don't know where that's gone on the, on the computer. Sorry, that's very, very confusing. No, it's not up where it normally would be. So another question here. Would you want to try making a windmill-powered electric sailboat? Yes. Okay, so this is the book. Now, if I do this, it's really low tech all of a sudden. Sorry, guys. So road, car, racing, and preparation. Okay, not too much sign, no sign there. That's a great little book to get you started. So that just gives you lots of tips as to how to actually get your racing car yeah, racing properly. Thanks for that. It's fantastic. Oh, I see. Now I found the... <laughs> I found the picture. That's great, but we'll do that later. <laughs> I'm going to try this just because this is the kind of exciting technology we like. So, uh, drop that down there like that. Look at that! There you go, brilliant. And it's funky, pixelated, and groovy. There we are. So, that's the book you want to be looking for. And uh, hi, hi, Dramen in Norway. Hi. Or hi, hi, actually. I could do that. That's about as much Norwegian as I can speak, pretty much. Other than Pushlespill. 
which means jigsaw puzzle. Oh, okay. Or puzzle, actually. But there we go. Um, <laughs> so we got <laughs> I've learned today. Um, yes, so uh, let's have a look at that. What's that one there? Um, oh, there we go. There we go. So, Ashley Goldsmith. Hi, Ed. I have a Volvo V70 2001, lovingly restored, 61,000 miles. I guess all of it was pretty kilometers. Who knows? Um, almost showroom condition now. Volvo, say, gearbox oil is for life. Should I change it at 20 years old? Yes. Really simple. Range Rovers have the same thing. They reckon their gearbox oil is for life. And I've known a number of gearboxes that have destroyed themselves because the gearbox oil wasn't necessarily up to the job or other things got in the way. I think you could never have too clean or too fresh gearbox oil. No, you? I mean, everything does, you know, yeah. degrade just just over, over a period of time. Yeah. And, you know, end of the day, even if it is perfectly okay, why not just change it anyway? Yeah. And obviously there's lots of little devices. You can get little pumps. You can kind of pump out the old gearbox oil, pump the new stuff in. If it's obviously automatic, which I can't tell from that, then... Um, Obviously, something we've done in the past, but not on the show yet, with the roll, with the Range Rover, yep. is you can actually get a machine to plug in, so in and out of your transmission cooler, and you can kind of pump out the old stuff, pump in some new stuff, and that way you know you've got completely clean gearbox mm -hmm. all in the gearbox. And uh, hello, Alan Harrison. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thoughts of doing crossover show with GT? Hmm? The Grand Tour. Oh, the Grand Tour. That, oh, that little show. Yo, that little well, fun. yes, I guess. Well, the thing is, we're going to have James in the orange at some point, even though he doesn't really know this, because obviously he roasted it very unkindly the other day, but he was actually quite kind during his roasting. So that for that, he gets to have a go to see how much fun it could be to be in an Aspen Orange. Maybe we could persuade him to come down to Brighton. That might be kind of cool. Be good. Maybe just be around the block. We'll see what happens. But James, if you're watching, which obviously you are, get in contact. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's that. I'll just phone you and annoy you. Cool. Thank you for that one. Um, hello, Shane Owen. Hello, Shane. Um, and let's have a little look. Okay, with there we go. That's my own sound effect. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Andrew, in, with your project cars, you decide you've done enough, or do you constantly think about ways to improve them? That's a very, well, I think very that's a, a good it's question. Work in progress. It's, it's almost it? a psychological. I mean, yeah, question. you just keep working on them all the time. It kind of depends. You? I think the thing is. We, I've had the, the, I guess, the privilege all over the years on the shows we've done. Obviously, we've always have to sell the car on at the end. You know, I did manage to buy the Lamborghini. That was quite exciting, and I had to sell it again when we moved to America. But basically, I think no project will probably ever finish because the moment you think you've done it, there's always going to be there's something always else, something that, else kind of, that comes up. Either there. that breaks, that's the usual thing, or certainly with a Range Rover, or actually you just kind of. I don't know, you, you fix all the niggles or all the designs you had before, and then you go, well, you know what, that blue is a really brilliant blue, but maybe I prefer a green. Yeah. Well, the red. sofa's a prime example of that, isn't it? It is. I, I'm definitely never going to finish that. Even if I start building a new one, I'm definitely going to finish it. But I think, well, that, with the sofa, I mean, the new one is probably going to have alley panels rather than MDF. It was very furniture-like at the time, yeah. but I think we could do better. Yeah. I think we make it so amphibious. Purpose, isn't it? It's going to be electric, probably. It's going to have a lot more gadgets, loads more load space, because it doesn't have any. You have to have everything on your lap, yeah. which is yeah. not very really practical, but it makes sense for a sofa, right? So, yes. No, I think, yes, I don't think there's ever really... I mean, if you're doing a show car, if you're getting it concourse sort of perfect or whatever it is, then probably there is a point where you don't want to mess with it anymore because obviously part of its charm is its originality. So there's always that as well. Yeah, no, definitely. But I think if, you know, if you're building a hot rod or you're kind of you know, really, really going into it or you're making a Range Rover to go off-road in, then probably chances are you're going to have things to fix either way. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah, I will good ponder question. it further. Thank, Thank you, you. Wonderful stuff. So uh, thanks, Sarg Blue. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, so I look for another little question down here. Now, okay, who's this one? So this is from JY again. Okay, so yes, if you need something metal 3D printed, let me know. No. Qualified um, copper for laser metal 3D printing at my university. Wow, wow. that's pretty cool because well, copper and lasers don't always go well together because, of course, there's lots of reflections and stuff. So that's actually quite interesting. But Very isn't it amazing? But thank you for the offer, and we'll, we'll definitely come up with something. I think we've got some battery technology might be quite fun to play with because I want to make a whole new array. So maybe we'll have a little chat with you about that. But I think. Again, I was saying earlier on, 3D printing is amazing. One of the things we're going to do with probably the Cadillacs is the windscreen we built for the 1916 uh, Cadillac. We didn't actually build it at all. We took it from the 1918, yeah. and it looks so good and looks so original. I want to actually try and copy Duplicate that. it. Yeah, yeah and the problem is, yeah. obviously, being 100 years old and being quite a fragile thing, there's not that many second-hand ones around. So that would be perfect. The idea is we're going to scan that in, get it into a computer. Once we've 3D scanned it, we can then actually kind of make a file where we can 3D print the yeah. sand that you can then cast the metal into to actually then make the frame. So that'd be quite exciting. I have no idea when we're going to get around to doing that, but it should be quite cool. It's another obviously. job, isn't it, for another day? No, it is. Yeah. And obviously, you see me playing around with the Korea form yeah. when we've been doing the, the stuff on the, on the ice cream van. So that, again, there's, it's, a, it's an itch I haven't fully scratched yet, say that. Okay. <laughs>
There's a, a question here from Mark USA, which just says, Q. So, <laughs> hello, Mark. Um, is it cold here, Ed? This is a question from Green. Yes. Very yeah, much. It's always cold here. It's, um, again, going back to the insulation. We need insulation quite urgently. Then once we've got insulation, we could then put some heat in, and that might and keep And keep the heat warmer. in. And, yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, if we heat the place... It, it stays, it stays warm, doesn't it? We just, it just add to the heat depth of the universe, the which doesn't yeah. seem very good. Yeah, so it's no. yeah thank you. Yeah, so uh, again, anybody got any leads on that? We could do with another partner who's really into insulation. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, well, there's a little question. Okay, so, so Jonathan F. So, hello, Ed. Hope you and Paul are well. Is Paul going to be with us more in the future videos as we both make a great team? Well, well we do. when he does some work, when he pulls his weight. Yeah, when I pull my weight. Yeah, yeah his considerable yeah. weight. Then I don't like getting dirty anymore. That's a, I know that's his problem. When you, when you get to his age, which, face it, is... Is old. Know, yeah, then, then, then basically... Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years older than you, so... At least. You know, at le well, he, no, gets, he gets no, older He gets older than me, older, older, yeah. older than me than every year. I mean, because 61 was a good year. 71, not so, you know. Well, that was the quality year, one of the best years. <laughs> yeah. So yes, so yeah, well, I think so. Well, as long as he behaves, definitely he's yeah, welcome to come yeah. and do some actual work rather yeah. than just grin at the TV screen yeah. for a long time. Well, you know. But isn't it nice to have him talking? Yeah. So that's something that obviously... Well, I was never allowed to talk, was I, before? I know, so. it's because he was quite obscene, very, very profane. But, but so now I, I he's calmed down. Yeah, I didn't talk for 15 years. Yeah. So, so now I'm just learning how to talk now. So no, that's why he was, we hard. just can't... Um, oh, hang on, thank you. I'll just, just pop that down into there. Hang on one oh. second. So that's now going to try and get rid of that. This is very good. And then it's a question. Can you live stream driving oh. the sofa? No, but that's a video. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, I wonder what's sure gonna happen here. Play full screen with audio. Ah, oh, now that's us. So we can now go. Uh, oh, I see what I've done now. So I think. There we go. We're back on. I think what I can do. <laughs> well, I think what I've just done is I've just changed the rear scene. So I'm now going to change that back. Um, um, <laughs> this is quite funny, isn't it? So yes, this is this is us working an absolute dream. I'm just going to go delete that scene. This might go horribly wrong. Bear with. Oh, Yay! What well brilliant! So that wasn't that, that was very professional. See yeah. when they when they do news live news. Yeah, don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, then obviously there is somebody there. There's the, the gallery in the background. So we have got our gallery. So Mrs. C and Ian are busy, you yeah, know, sort of paying attention and, and trying to help. And I'm just making that make harder. So that's kind of cool. So yeah. I've now um, also got rid of some other bits and pieces, which is a shame. So <laughs> we'll go here now. Okay, we'll carry on. I'm just going to stop that for a second. So. Um, We'll answer another question because I've just broken everything that was going on here. Um, so, uh, oh, free, I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go into here like that. So, a question here from Joseph Matthews What are your thoughts on hydrogen combustion engines? I actually think they are very much part of the solution because yep. obviously, electric is groovy and obviously, emission free really is our goal, it should be our goal. When we're in Norway, obviously that's a country that's very much adopted electric life, if you like, and it is quite a transformation. You're walking around, we did a lot of walking over there, because yep. uh, it's a wonderful countryside and stuff, but just walking down by the road, almost every single car in Oslo is electric now. Wow. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing, and there are so few fumes, it's, it's an absolute joy. Wow. So, you know, why wouldn't we want that all over yep. the world, for yep. one thing? Yep. But I think, to, obviously, burning hydrogen, I mean, to, hydrogen to burn is a very much less efficient process. But you can still store, at the moment, more energy in a tank of hydrogen than you can, perhaps, in a set of batteries. And also, it's much easier to fill up very, very, very quickly. So, obviously, you can already buy hydrogen at the pumps or some pumps around yep. the country, which yep. is quite exciting. There are a number of cars available already that burn hydrogen. Yep. Um, but um, so, so, even though it's slightly less or maybe half as efficient, perhaps, as an electric vehicle, obviously, like we were just talking about with the workshop, 
if we're generating lots of electricity we have actually got all that energy coming in there and your batteries are full up you still want to use that energy so yeah. why not make hydrogen and obviously same thing with wind machines so rather than actually throttling them down like the government do at the moment to actually you know, so, so we're not you know, pumping extra energy into the grid you could actually then just convert them into hydrogen at the point perhaps or somewhere else and then that would actually solve a problem and make them more yeah. efficient and we'd all live happily ever after so that'd be very good yeah. so i think Brilliant. it's a great thing and we will do something about it on the show so that's a great question thank you very much yeah um now let's look for another question here uh no i can't read that one from here <laughs> oh there we go that's quite interesting so this is from D Asbury. What was your most expensive car you've had to fix? Also, your super cool. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, no, that was to you, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah, what's the most expensive car you've had to fix? Yeah, what is the most expensive car you had to fix? I would say, well, actually, probably the Cadillacs. I guess before that was the Lamborghini, maybe. But that was quite pricey. That was quite pricey. Yeah, Lamborghini was. To quite get a bull in the China shop. That was fantastic. Yeah. yeah that so was so that was pretty cool. I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I'm think i trying to think of what else there must be. I did, well, you know, I'd love to, my, I think one of my dream cars to work on one day would be a Duesenberg, and that would obviously be millions of oh, pounds yeah, worth. So, yeah, so that would be quite pick, fantastic, yeah. but I haven't got my dirty mitts on that yet, or my dirty gloved mitts on that. Duesenberg. Yeah. Lovely name, isn't it? Duesenberg. Yeah, it's cool. Well, that's where yeah. that saying comes from. What a yeah. doozy. What a doozy. Because yeah. they were the best thing on the planet at the time with wheels. So it was really yeah. good. So, go on, you must have worked on some expensive stuff. What about, you know, some exotica. <sighs> We're saying that the, you know, Ferrari. We did a Ferrari, didn't we? That was quite expensive, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, but it was. It wasn't. We didn't sell it for very much. We should have done. If we hung on to that, that would have been worth a few quid, actually. Yeah, it would have. Yeah. But um, I mean, what about some of your own cars? You had a quite an expensive Porsche for a bit. Yeah, I didn't work on it though. It just went in and got fixed. Uh, <laughs> That's probably the right thing to do. Well, no, you're working on was, cars all yeah. week. You don't really want to have to fix. Well, no, it was kind of. It was under warranty, so yeah, yeah. yeah providing you had it serviced, yeah, at regular intervals. Yeah. yeah. The warranty was still valid, so uh, that's fab. So I think it's um, I think so. I'm just I'm just doing some admin in the background here, and um, which is very exciting. So I'm just going to pop that down there like so. And I'm just going to um, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop that. It's okay. Don't you worry about me. I'm talking about yourselves, and um, which probably are because we're talking, well, talking so much. About, yeah. Go on, so, carry on. That's one other question then. Come on then. Um, so I think um, the um, you've got. A, Question here from Gary Philip Philipiak. Um, my dad has a 2012 Honda Jazz, and the only way he'll travel is by licking his tom tom and sticking into the windshield. How do I get him to change car? Any suggestions? <laughs> That's a very very good question. Um, well, the thing is, Honda clearly, Jazz. I mean, popular car. Yeah, but what's the um, the thing that everybody's talking about these days? What's that little tiny um, the um, Yaris? That's kind of a. Oh, yeah. It's kind of similar size, yeah, I guess, yeah. and it's super sporty. It's down with the kids. Yeah. Very, very customizable, very tunable. Yeah, that I'd could work. Yeah. yeah, I had a nice little Yaris. Yeah. And you could still stick the Tom Tom to that. Yeah. So that'd be fine. Well, yeah. I'd say they'd probably come with one now, built in. Well, yeah, but yeah. you want to feel at home. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know. oh, that was always the fun thing. You, know, you must have done this. It's a great game. If you get a number of sat navs and then stick them all on the screen or whatever, and then actually then go a long way and then see all the different routes that you could take and just have a little argument with them as you go along. It's great fun. Really great way to get lost. A top tip, probably not. <laughs> um, um, okay, there's a question about it's a similar uh, sofa thing. So, Dartmoor Man Cave, how do you register a sofa for road use? Good question. Basically, when I registered that at the time, it was just in. We hadn't got the new SVA at the time, but now it's the IVA test. It was actually a Q plate. So, in the UK, we're very lucky that you can actually you know sort of if you, if you comply with a whole lot of rules you can pretty much get almost anything on the road and as long as you actually obviously can comply yeah. with those rules and the sofa i mean the best example of that was in the uk you have to have a rear view mirror um on a car and obviously i didn't really want that it was going to ruin the sofa but in, in, in a kind of commercial vehicle if you like you have to have a bulkhead and the, and then well you can have a bulkhead and the bulkhead touches the roof then you don't have to have a wing mirror so of course or in a rear view mirror rather so that meant that of course the back of my seat was the bulkhead and the top of the seat was then the roof I didn't have to have my rear view mirror. So kind of, there are lots of ways of kind of working your way through the system. Um, but now you'd have to go through the IVA test, which is kind of like a really tough 
MOT, so there's an awful lot of construction and use regulations yep. you have to comply with. You know, have your speedo has to work properly, the lights have to be in the right position, the right height, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But again, it's really cool, we're very lucky. You just have a really long list of stuff you have to comply with, and if you comply, you get to have it on the road. So yeah. that's it. So that's, that's also how we'll be getting the shopping trolley on the road. And when do you see that? Three and a half meters high, it's nutty, isn't it? It's crazy. Fantastic. Right, another little question here. In fact, we have gone on some time, haven't we? So we've actually blown through an hour here. So apologies. Uh, or, we do apologize. It. <laughs> if anybody's still watching. So let's have a look. Um, so we've done that one already. I'm just going to go for some more comments. Oh, here we go. Um, I know, we just had that one. So, okay, it was you, Dark Mode. So thank you. Thank you for asking so many times. We've now, at least now you know. Yeah, thank um, you. <laughs> um, what are our thoughts on the MGTF? Oh, I've just, just about to go over there. There you go. That's from Dubois 14. Um, so I guess this is the new one or the old one? Is there, is there a new TF? Because now MG no, I, is I don't new know, actually. I don't know. So the old one, we had, um, um, what was that? Do we have a TF or it was an MGF? Yes, it was an MGF. I, don't, I think it might have been TF. Anyway, they're really cool sort so of driverless cars, cars yeah. if you like. I mean, obviously, they're a lot of car for the money, especially they're, they're so cheap these days. They, obviously, the Achilles heel is the engine, is, the, is, is that sort of the K-series. And But there are lots of things you can do to make them reliable. So basically, the problem is that the radiator is right at the front. Obviously, the engine's in the middle, near the back. Um, and essentially, when they were first designing the prototype, obviously, they made quite a nice, robust engine. And of course, the K-series has gone on to be extremely reliable. Many of our comfy banana vehicles, like the bed and all that kind of stuff, have got that in there. And they are bulletproof. Yeah, They're but amazing. I think, I think the 8 valve seems to be more reliable than the, the 16. 16 valve. Yeah. And that's the thing. So what happened is that to try and sort of cut a sort of few costs they ended up actually sort of well they sort of weakened there was like a little girdle that goes on the bottom of the of the, of the crankcase or inside the you know the the, the sump and they, they removed that and they also came went with a slightly cheaper gasket head gasket and the upshot was that over time basically when you're getting quite hot when the when the thermostat opens obviously all the cold water that's still in the system in the radiator then kind of floods in to the engine shocks it and then of course then generally yeah. distorts the head gasket so you can still buy the little kind of girls to fix onto that you can still buy super sporty uh, sort of um uh, you know the gaskets whatever and so you can certainly fix those problems and then but once you've got it all working a tree it was fantastic we drove around the tt circuit uh, to the isle of man and that was an amazing thing to do in a very very kind of what it looks like quite a sedate car on the outside it was great fun yeah brilliant yeah, yeah so we rate those thank you very much good question i guess the tf is actually better than the mgf and it's standard form but anyway there we are um <laughs> another question here i think did we or not sure not sure not from there um how do we resolve the gearbox problems in general thank you to fan uh, at teak 12. um i'm not quite sure which gearbox problems we're talking about but no. essentially um if it's a manual if it's, if it's an automatic they obviously there are different things i mean a the first thing is yeah. things like check for oil obviously you know you can run a manual gearbox without any oil for some minutes <laughs> and very Before quickly all the edges of the gears will get it will sort of will start to but an auto, obviously, off. you you need oil. It, yeah, it won't work. Um, and, and and also, obviously, old oil in both of those. Obviously, if, if the oil gets thicker, I guess the manual gearbox will be more protected, sort of, and then it will start to crunch up. Whereas the automatic is a much more sensitive thing. If you get dirt into an automatic gearbox, it can be you yeah. know, often fatal once it gets into all the galleries and stuff. So, I think the first thing to do is try and sort of narrow down your various issues. Of, you know what the problem is, and try and sort of yeah. at least. You know, work out if it's like, for example, a gear doesn't work. We had our T5 van that we worked on at the very beginning of the series. Um, we actually lost fifth gear. It's got six six, six speed gearbox. Yeah. Um, we lost fifth gear, um, and so it's actually possible to drive for ages and ages and ages with just this kind of crunchy gear in place. But obviously, eventually, you know, we knew exactly what we were going to have to fix. But if the gearbox is seized completely or it makes lots of horrible noises, again, you can do stuff by seeing which shafts it makes a noise on because there's obviously a number of different shafts or lay shafts actually in the gearbox, and so usually you have a number of gears stuck on one shaft so you can actually then work out perhaps which gears or which bearings might be the ones at fault yep. but again you need to be slightly braver I guess if you're going to take a gearbox apart and have a look at it yourself because often you need special tools you need to have a really good memory yeah <laughs> and I think autos are more probably specialised than yes, the manual gearboxes so too. Sort of like a clean room environment so also, good luck yeah. with resolving yeah, the problems um, um, I hope you can get that sorted yeah thank you and um Oh, hang on, I'm trying to answer. Oh, 
Okay. So, partner, so this is Jack Bailey. I'm trying to answer your question. You've already tried the, sim uh, the simple stuff. You're going to have to remove the transmission. Fair enough. There we okay. go. Hope that answers that question. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool that you guys are talking to amongst each other as well. Okay. So, we've got a question here from Michael Byam. Um, I'm a high school auto shop teacher in Canada and have a 65 Sunbeam Alpine with a 75 Toyota Corolla engine in it. I need to rewire it. Where would you start a job like that? It's a very good question. Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Well, I'm sure you could probably use some of the existing wiring. Well, I'll tell you what, what I did. I don't know if you're, if, you're, if you're a fan of spreadsheets. This is where I get really, really geeky. Um, but actually, so a friend of mine, Mark Amblard, actually kind of it sort of showed me the value of spreadsheets, but also my wife actually showed me that you could have colour on spreadsheets. When we got married, I had no idea. But really, it really helps to kind of order your head. So when we were doing actually, the, again, the T5 van, we actually swapped the body around the drivetrain because um, I had it was sort of like a cheaper spec. Uh, sort of, it was, there were very yeah. few little sort of add-ons on the, on the earlier model body, and I wrapped it around a load of Armco. So we swapped that for one with the electric windows and AC and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, even though they were like one year out, the wiring rooms were very, very different. So what I did is actually put all the wires that I was trying to work out where we're going to connect them to in a yeah. spreadsheet so I can say, oh, these are the ones that go here, these are the ones that go here, and it made it much easier to see where you had a missing wire or whether something, you know, because yeah. in fact we always ended up with one wire. We never really knew where it went, and I think I've only recently worked out what it was for. So uh, we may even do that on the show. Yeah. So, so that would be the first thing I would say. It's all about being ordered and methodical in your process. I think if you can get the motor, obviously if you, if you actually bought the engine sort of spare or sort of if you could get it running on the bench if you like with its own wiring loom and then you can obviously make sure that you can then work out what all the wires do in the car before you remove the engine that would be brilliant if it's already in there and the wiring is being done by someone else that's slightly more scary but literally just start with the methodical stuff and the first thing is you're going to need an ignition feed make sure you've got that that will work out if it's obviously got a brain to play around with or you've got um, other electronics to worry about you need to make sure that you know I mean obviously if you can get hold of wiring diagrams that would be fine so I've got a little question here or something oh uh -huh. we'll go to that question later there's a daily what's your daily drive paul my daily drive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yes so basically i think it's really about being methodical and and, and sort of it, lots of photographs lots of wiring diagrams make sure you've got the right diagram for the right year and spec of your car or both of them and then see if you can find any discrepancies because certainly that's what happened with the volkswagen even though they were almost identical yeah. there was enough stuff that was different that was a nightmare yeah, i remember i remember it well so yeah. what's your daily driver my daily driver. Well, I've got two daily drivers. At so least. I've got a Volkswagen Golf Mark IV, a little diesel, which mm -hmm. is quite pleasant, and I've got a Discovery, Land Rover Discovery Four. Yeah, that's true. Which is okay, and it's nice and comfortable, and does the job. Yeah, and, and like, occasionally I drive my van. So he's got those other stuff. You've got a little uh, Angler, haven't you? I've got a little Ford Angler Estate C10 yeah, truck. I don't actually drive that very often, though. No. no, that's true. No, I mean it's a 1964 Ford Angler Estate. Um, I've had it probably about six months now. Not too sure what I'm going to do with it. I think it's a... a, a drive it. Start by driving Yeah, it. well, yeah, but I don't, I don't really want to drive it to work. Oh, that's true. Because it takes too long. I'd have to leave too early. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, leave so the day before. No, normally I drive a Discovery 4 and... Yeah, well, it's, well, it's a great car for towing, yeah, it, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a good car for towing. We yeah. should maybe get the Anglia on the show. Yeah, we could actually. I'm sure there's tons of jobs that need yeah, doing. Yeah, probably it's leaks. It's yeah. got lots of leaks. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. it's, 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 it's of the era. It's isn't an it? old Ford. Yeah, old Ford's exactly. leak. Old Total loss leak. oil yeah. systems. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Fantastic. Right, let's find another question. Okay, greetings. Oh, now. That's a good question. This is actually one for Paul again, really. So, Adrian Van Zilt from uh, Namib Namibia. Greetings, oh, Namibia. Greetings. How do you balance the SU carburetors on a V8 Land Rover properly? Well, you. you I think we've done it on the show before. You, so you need a vacuum gauge. So you need to obviously measure and make sure you've got the correct amount of air being sucked in each one, because that's really important to. to it looks know, like to a get, kind of um, balance. Yeah, it's, it's kind of it's an interesting thing. So basically, it looks it, like a kind of um, I don't know. It's like a cork almost. Yeah. The little dial on you it. Little dial on it. And obviously the air flows through it, and of course then makes the dial move. So you can actually see exactly how much volume there is kind of going through engine. And of course it's just about balancing those up. So yeah, you obviously you want need to, set to them kind of get them more or less the same. Yeah. And then once you've got that, you can, you know. Yeah. So I mean, what I would do, I would see if you can, you can get yourself a manual, so you, to give you a basic setup. But if you kind of wind everything back to nothing, and then kind of get them set to the right place, so you've got your idle screws. Yeah, there be right there be base settings. If you if you if you do get a workshop manual for the car, there be base settings. So. The idle mixture screw maybe two and a half turns mm -hmm. out, you know, fast idle maybe two turns out. So there'd be a base setting, start with the base setting 
and then it's imperative that you get the carbs balanced yeah. with wobble to taste you need yes. an air meter really yeah that is the best way. Probably. But also, things like also, you know, don't assume that they're in perfect nick, you know, unless they're even brand new, I guess, because obviously you've got to have the dash pots for the right oil and that kind of stuff as yeah, well. Yeah, that's important as well, because it's hugely, you, you need, need the oil in the top of the dash pot so that when the, when the pot comes up, it's cushioned. Mm. What you don't want it, you don't want it coming up too hard. Well, it but, can bounce But around. also, you don't yeah. want too much oil in it where it can't actually come up. Of course, yeah. Because then you know that that's that's even worse. So it needs like, to be right. And also, if you if you bought the car from someone, or you've, or maybe you bought the car second hand and stuff, also you need to make sure that the needles are the same. Well, yeah. and stuff. So so it's really just going to go through the basics. So you sort of start. We go find. Make sure that everything's identical. Make sure that you've got all the same settings for a base start, and then once it's got it, hopefully it should start getting running, and then use your air sync to actually yeah. measure it all. Good question. Yeah, yeah good question. Thank you. So hello, James Owen. Still have the blue bubble camper van? That's a good question. I don't still have that actually. So we well, bought it. Yeah. I don't know how many years ago that was, and it was great fun. Had it for the summer, messed around with it a little bit. So, to be honest, it wasn't quite what we were originally hoping for as a van, but it was great fun. I wanted a different paint job, and I wanted a bigger engine and stuff. I wanted the, there's a South African version of that van with the Audi five foot engine I mentioned earlier on, and yeah. that is amazing. And that's yeah. what I was looking for. But they're really, really rare, and obviously mostly only in South Africa. And um, and, and it was the diesel was like eh, it's not quite so good. But then the cameraman on that on that show actually yeah. uh, his wife was an artist wants to carry these big kind of easels around big uh, sort of um whatever you call them um canvases around and so and so he thought it'd be the ideal thing so he badgered me until i sold it to him yeah Great. and then i think oh actually that's yeah a good point. yeah and, and many years later yes um unfortunately it caught fire on the m3 motorway i believe so that was rather and nothing to do with my glow plugs. No, nothing, nothing to do. <laughs> it caught fire, so it was a lot, lot of years later. What, your so son Sam was a, was a yes, mechanic my, on the my show. My son Sam, he was on the, on the way to. He was stuck uh, in traffic uh, for hours and hours and, and hours. And saw it, yeah. and uh, it was on fire. So and actually I, don't last, know, I don't know how far it, you know, whether it was completely destroyed no, 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 or it whether it's still on the road. Or, the last time I heard, it, basically, it ended up in a scrapyard in Gosport. Oh, so no. somebody out there could still be owning this yeah, vehicle. Because obviously, yeah. you know, they're quite. Uh, well, they're getting quite rare now. Yeah, God, yeah, they are rare. Yeah. So, um, I've got a question here from Dave McGrath. Is John's Range Rover the worst condition car ever worked on? By anybody ever? Possibly. Uh, no, well, it's not quite that bad. But I think... Um, oh, that's a good question. Well, it's mean, pretty close. We've, we've gone quite a long way on it, haven't we? Yeah, but it's... I mean, I mean we've just got the chassis now. So, we've got nothing else. Just the chassis. Yeah, but is it the worst car you've worked on? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, thanks, John. I'm trying to think there's yeah. nothing... And I'm not being negative. <laughs> <laughs> it's just negative waves. I think... I don't know. The only thing that possibly came close was the Amphicar. But I actually think the Amphicar was a bit more of a breeze, frankly, because it was pretty much only bodywork, wasn't it? Whereas it was only bodywork. Everything. Yeah. I mean, the interior I mean, of the car on the was Amphicar, okay. we didn't even take the engine out of the Amphicar, did no, we? No, it's true. Mechanically, yeah. it was sound. I mean, this one needs work. Obviously, we're going to make it a little hotter, perhaps, yeah. than standard. So, yeah, yeah Amphicar well, was just little. body work, yeah. whereas this is body work, chassis, engine. Yeah. It's everything. So, so it's a good question. Is, it probably is the I worst car. I think it is the worst car yeah. anybody's ever worked on. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. To, yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, there we go. There's one from Dave. Um, I, mean, I think um, I'm planning an EV conversion on a Citroen GSA. That's very cool. Um, but the LHM pump is integral to the flat four. How would you resolve this? I would remove it from the flat four. <laughs> no, well, I think. Well, to be honest, that's a good question. I think. Well, I think the thing about it is that you could you could actually take it. Is it inside the flat four? I mean, there's a couple of ways you could go. If it's actually part of the castings, then you could obviously scan through you scan the, the castings and actually have some new castings machined or actually cast as you yep, yep. and then actually make it as a separate unit that would be a way and then attach that somewhere onto the electric motor arrangement onto the drivetrain or whatever um you could i guess try and work out what the pump's sort of spec is so it's sort of its volume and its pressure um and what it's moving around and yep. what the seals need to be and stuff because i guess it'd be mineral oil i suppose being a citron i suppose um, I don't yeah. know. So yeah, so, so I just make sure that you get the spec, and then there, there's bound to be a variable pump or adjustable pump that you could get that could do the same job. That might be a little bit easier, but I mean, where's the challenge in that? Frankly? Yeah. So I think I think I would I would go with trying to use the original pump, but perhaps in if if, if it's not unboltable, kind of in its own new housing. That would be cool. So yeah. good luck with that. Yeah. But it's a great project. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much, Andy H. Thank How you, Andy. cold is the workshop in degrees? About. Um, I don't know. It's probably if you're talking absolute zero, it's just above that. So yeah. Kelvin, I know, it's probably, probably like, yeah. about five degrees at the moment, I would imagine. 
I don't know actually. Probably the phone would tell us. Yeah, yeah it's, it's probably not, about five. It's um, four degrees. Oh, four degrees. Oh, okay. Well, See, he is very yeah, good with numbers. Yeah. So four degrees. I'm not sure. It's possibly verging on inhumane. Yeah. So actually, we probably would be in a in a, in a I don't know a works an employment yeah. tribunal. We'd yeah. obviously be thrown out. Yeah, put the space so on. We probably should. So yes. Hi to Costa Rica. Hi Costa Rica. Yeah, greet it. Pura Vida. Yeah, cool. Um, now, Paul, here's another question for Paul. Oops. Do you have any motorbikes? I used to have a motorbike. When I was younger, it was everything was motorbikes, and I had lots of them. I passed my motorbike test, I think, 1985, wow. believe it or not. Um, and my last bike I had was a Suzuki 1200 Bandit, which that's I pretty, sold probably... That's a proper bike, Yeah, it? about five that's years ago. I, I never used to ride it. What's the fastest one of those would do? It's probably not... It's probably probably do 140 miles an hour, I guess. I've had faster bikes, yeah. um, but that was my last bike, Suzuki 1200. So all the bikes before it. that, were they full size or they just like those little mini motors? No, 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 no they're all full size bikes, <laughs> thank you. And, and did my, they also uh, seat two people? Yeah, my first bike was an FS1 e, FS1 e Yamaha, like a little fizzy, it was called a fizzy. Yes, oh they're cool, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. You know what, I once did a job, and uh, like you when you got your, it's a much better job frankly that you did, because I did a job and I got, I swapped it for, a, or swapped the work, for a Triumph Tina, uh, which is really? like a little scooter. Oh, lovely. And, and it took me an aid to work out that actually to start it, you have to be sitting yeah. on the saddle because oh, it's got a little okay. switch yeah, under yeah. the saddle. And that, that, that wasted a lot of the time. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's mad. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let's have a look. Uh, oh, okay. Let's have a look at this one. So from Terry Aldous. Hi, I'm Paul. Got a rumble from the rear left wheel on a C-Max. I've replaced the hub and disc, rotated the wheels, and it's still noisy. What should I look yeah. at next? Well, it could be. Uh, what is it? Rear wheel drive? I, don't know, I was going to yeah, say it could hub, be. It could hub be hub and disc. So obviously, I'd imagine it replaced the hub. And it's obviously got the bearing in it. So it's obviously the wheel bearing. But it's it, could it be hub. to do with the transmission then? Like if there's an axle no, to worry about, no, or is there no honest C-Max? So I mean. And it's still noisy. That is really interesting. Although, I mean, to be honest, I'll tell you what, there's a really cool little gizmo you can buy, which is basically it's a set of microphones. I think it's like, sort of like four or six sort of magnetic microphones and a little listener, yeah. if you like. And what you can do is you can place them around the car and then you could actually then drive along and then actually listen. You can see where the noise is coming or hear where the oh, noise is coming Oh, that's a good idea. From, yeah. Which is really smart because actually sometimes, like the other day, I had a real problem. I had a r r real rattle from the suspension of the Range Rover. And, um, you know, and I, I was convinced it was actually the front offside, uh, you know, sort of suspension. It turned yeah. out it was the opposite side. And it just because it was closer okay. close to the middle, it was very difficult to tell. Yeah. But also, we actually had also, again, a rumble for ourselves with that with the Range Rover. And we actually changed some tyres. So the guys at Vintage Tyres actually gave us some snow tyres to try out over in Norway and they worked an absolute treat which is fantastic but the interesting thing was that the tyres we had on before were obviously slightly had a sort of bit of an issue yeah. and what I thought was a, a bearing rumble which I was just going to leave until later it was actually a tyre went away it was actually the tyre and wow. you never would have guessed to look at it, it looked, the tyre looked kind of fine it was obviously worn down a bit so I, and it was quite a hard sort of rubber so it wasn't and it wasn't sort of snow specs so we weren't allowed to use it in the winter yeah. but um, that was it so it might be worth having a little look at the tyres I mean what you could do is sort of rotate your tyres around and then see if, if the, the rumble noise changes, moves, yeah, maybe going to be your put it on the back. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck yeah. with that, sir. Fantastic. Good question. Thank you. So uh, another question here from uh, Savage. Oh, so hello, hello, Savage Media. Oh, hi. So, um, oh, you're off to Poland tonight. Have a good weekend. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Have a good weekend. <laughs> Thank you, Savage Media. Yes. Um, oh, it's a difficult question for me, especially as the missus is near in the room. Um, so, a question from Luke. How many vehicles do I have and what are they? Oh, God. Well, we could ignore the comfy banana selection, but obviously we have a giant shopping trolley, a driving bed, bathroom, uh, a shed somewhere, the orange, yeah. sofa, um, that. Got the two Cadillacs, we've got the 16 and the 18, 100 euro Cadillacs. Yeah, some Range Rovers. Got a few too many ice cream vans at the moment. That yeah. will be getting shed. If you need an ice cream van, nice, nice CF1 Bedford. Give me a shout because that definitely has to go because you can only have so many. Um, yeah, so that, what else yeah. we got in here? I guess, well, I've got a lot of Range Rovers. One of them works at the moment pretty much, so that's good. Yeah. And um, I think pretty much that's it, isn't it? I, 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 we had lots of other stuff, but when we went to America, you know, we, we had to sort of tidy up a lot. And so I had a Fiat 500 we had to sell, I had the Lamborghini Uraco I had to sell. Yeah. Um, all kinds of other rubbish in the yard we had to get rid of. So it's kind of, I think I'm learning as I get older, it's better to have less. Less is not more, but less is better. 
I don't know, there's probably a new adage there because I think, um, you know, I might, we might get ourselves one day on like a little London to Brighton cast or something pre-1904. That might be quite fun. But I think if you've got a mission for it, well, certainly with the Cadillacs, we're going to do the Peking to Paris one day. Um, and I'm assuming it's all still there, whatever. But it, that would be a fantastic thing to do. And, and so that's a really good mission. And until I've done that, I'm not really allowed to buy any more stupid projects. No, I think you've got enough. <laughs> I think I have. Definitely. Great question. Thank you very much. Cool stuff. Now... Um, a question here from Matthew in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, what do you think of modern Range Rovers? Well, it's a good question. I mean, well, I, 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 mean I like them. I yeah. think they're great. But what do you mean by modern? Do you mean like current Range Rovers? Or like well, not, well, obviously the new ones out now. Yeah. Which is... Don't know much about really. No, I don't know. I think it's probably too early to call on it. one. I think the previous one to the one that's just come out, so the one they've just stopped making. I believe if Adam was on the show, a bearing all, really, he almost knows all about them, he? he well, yeah, he works for JLI, and he was saying that they are just fantastic cars. It's almost a shame that they stopped making them because they, they they've sorted out all the issues with them. And I think that's the thing with more modern Range Rovers is that wiring has been a bit of an Achilles heel. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of other little bits that go wrong over time. But as long as, as long as you kind of look after them and sort of keep on top of the problems, then they are fantastically capable I yeah. mean obviously the first one I bought was a modern-ish one we went we actually drove from Oslo to Bergen across the top of the mountains through loads of snow in the middle of the winter and it didn't miss a beat absolutely fantastic but obviously when we first got to Norway we first got there the, the fuel froze had the wrong additives in yeah. there dashboard cracked everything would <laughs> start up so it took a little bit of going but I think yeah the modern ones I think they're sort of slowly getting yeah. better but they're very comfortable and I can't live yeah, without they are nice. they are nice. <laughs> so um I'm not sure what that message is saying. So, um, tips for buying MG Midget from Unboring Videos. Very good title. Yes. Uh, an M- okay. So, yeah, just check from Rust, basically. <laughs> I think. Well, that is the kind of the most yeah, obvious thing. Yeah, I think. I think that is the obvious thing. I mean, the engines. I mean, like, I think they've got the early ones had the A series engine, didn't they? I don't remember. I guess so. Yeah. And I guess, but what did they? And go then the later the ones, people? they had the like the 1500, didn't they? The, the Later generation. So yeah, I guess. Well, I, so I actually think probably then an earlier one's better because yeah. you can still buy. And that's one of the things to think about actually when you when you're looking into buying a, a classic car. Is you want to make sure that a you've perhaps joined a local club or sort of like a national club, or whatever it is. So you've actually got people who can give you advice yeah. to, you know, to help you out when you when you kind of come up with a problem or you're going to meet people who have actually. Of course, forums are a great place to go as well if you're on the internet to actually find people who have had the same problems you're about to have. But I think the classic thing is making sure you can get a model where you can still get all the parts. So with the A series, because of the Mini, you, everything you is available. Much get everything. Yeah, but I just amazing. think with, you know, you need to just check, don't you, structurally. Yes, I mean I think Rust is going to be the Achilles sort of that. I mean obviously all the mechanical stuff is dead easy to play with. So I think I think that's you can always sort the mechanical out. Yeah, and but interior I stuff. I mean again, you can get a trim or you can do some of the work yourself. Obviously some bits are I mean, quite simple. And obviously they've only got so, two seats. Yeah, so that's nice so and easy. But the door cards, that kind of stuff, you could kind of make yourself and customize it if you like. So I think yes, it's a good little car to go for. But I think one thing also when you're buying a car, especially one you haven't played with before. I would recommend trying out a number of them. You know, see if see if you can sort of get a go, find a friend. You know, sort of go to go to a, perhaps a car show or something. See if you can you know have a lift or at yeah, least you know, have a little get, drive around the field. The feel of it. Just yeah, because yeah, then you're going to know when you find the one that's yours or the one that you want to be yours. You know, you know whether that noise sounds like it should be there yeah, or if it feels no, right. Very, suspension yeah. squishy enough. So that's a yeah, good tip. Hopefully with that. And have we got any plans for Workshop Diaries birthday? That's kind of nearly now, isn't it? That's a good point. That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you for that. I have no idea. I mean, to be honest, I think the birthday might actually coincide with our million subscribers. I don't know what we're up to now. I actually managed to miss the 924. I'll have a quick look here. It, um, you'd think I'd be able to find this out more quickly. But um, so it is, we're up to... Oh, yeah, okay, we're getting there. So we're just in, I think. So I think... Within the next couple of weeks, months, whatever it is, if you, all of you pay attention and subscribe yeah. and tell your mates to subscribe, tell your family to subscribe, then we might get to the million mark. And if we can tie that in with the birthday celebrations. That would be absolutely perfect. There it? should be a cake. Yeah. Definitely be a cake. And it'd yeah. be, maybe with a million, uh, what was it, they call them hundreds and thousands. Maybe yeah, have thousands yeah. of millions yeah. on the cake and that would sort that out. That'd be perfect. Yeah, that'd be great. I think, you know, I think it'd be nice to go on a, bit of a road trip as well, actually. Yeah, where do you, where do you think we should go? Well, I don't know. I tell you what, why don't you tell us what we should do for both the birthday and the million yeah, subscriber million, celebrations? Yeah. Obviously, we've now, yeah. of course, we've already please, sorted out we're going to go let, with Colin. Please let us know. So, okay, what's this? So, um, 
from Terminal Velocity. Hello, Terminal Velocity. That's a great title. I actually wrote a show about that name, which is quite wonderful. It might, you never, it might happen one day. So your dad was a Royal Engineer, broke down in the Mark 1 Fiesta and was cracked distributor cap. He used nail varnish to seal the crack to get you home. What improvised repair have you used? That's a great little thing. That fix. is a good, isn't it? That's a good little... And that's a great thing. Thank, thank you, Terminal Velocity. No, well, actually, really interesting. Yeah, you I, must I have guess... done those because all your cars broke down. <laughs> well, I tell you what, when we were in the sofa, we broke down a lot when we were yeah, in California because I had a problem with overheating because I hadn't fixed something. Um, and and we had this pipe that kept bursting. Basically, it was like a plastic tea piece, and it, and it burst in the desert. Hence, why we had the fire because we had a hundred percent coolant, and it basically threw itself all over the exhaust. And immediately, we were driving along a bit of a stutter. Looked round, and there was a fireball behind my head. I thought, oh, that's not so good. We probably should pull over. And, and that was basically because of this little pipe, and it plagued us for the rest of that trip. And at one point, I was looking for little bits of broken beer bottle to try and bypass that yeah. tea piece. So that was quite crazy. But recently, I think the other day actually, we had a problem with the laser. There was a crack, little tiny, little kind of, uh, I suppose, a spout off a cooling part. And there was a little tiny crack in there, which you couldn't see until we actually taken it out and had a really close look. And then we worked out that's where the water or the fluid was coming from. And then Mrs. C actually suggested, why not use a little bit of heat shrink? And we've got some heat shrink with the glue that goes on the inside. So we cut it down to size, popped it over, heated it on, and that sorted out a treat. So that yeah. was a great little fix. Yeah. And, you know, and so, but, Yeah, that's good. I mean, I've got a good one. Go on. um, many years ago when I had my four pop, so I had a four popular and it had a Rover V8 engine in. And I was on the way back from um, Guildford Cruise and I was coming down the, the A road, the 331, yeah. and all of a sudden I lost all the coolant. So Careless. I Careless. pulled over, and unfortunately a core plug that came out, oh, it wow. just popped out the side of the block. Yeah, that's not good. But what I managed to do, I managed to find a hose, and I jammed it in the side of the block, in the core plug hole, okay. and then I put that hose into the top of the radiator <laughs> after I filled it out with coolant. That is brilliant. So what was happening, it was actually leaking out the block yeah, and, just and going, going back, back into the, the radiator. So that actually got me home. So that was a that good fix. A so I was fix. lucky to find this piece of hose that managed yeah. to fit tightly into the block. That's, that's a great fix. So it kind of recycled that's the water. Nice. No, not not a permanent fix, but it managed to... Oh, it got you home. It that's got me home, thing. which is the main thing. So I'm talking that, about that. That was my one. Yeah, I had, a, I had a beach buggy years ago, and um, it was possibly the ugliest beach buggy in the world. Um, it was shortened, as always, and stuff, engine hanging out the back, and we were messing around in London, and I don't know where we were going, and suddenly the throttle cable snapped. And weirdly, for some reason, I had a pair of binoculars in a case in the back of the beach buggy. So I actually used the strap and put it over. We sort of had a hole in the back of the body. Where oh, and, and, it just, and so I just had to drive yeah. along, pulling the throttle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was that was entertaining. But there we go. Yes, that's a good question. So uh, it's, um, hang on. So this is a question from. Yeah, it's an answer. To. It's an answer. Gary Philippak, you're not going to tell us. We'll have to experiment. I'm not going to tell you. I think I understand that question or that answer. Yes, I hope that made any sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long is this stream going to be? It's a good point. You know what? I tell you what, we should maybe stop and then yeah. do another one some other time. Yeah, I think so. How long have we been going? Uh, an hour and a half. Have you really? Wow. <laughs> so apologies. <laughs> yeah, even, sorry. That is crazy, isn't it? All right, well, thank you very much for watching. Yeah, it's thank been you very much. Absolutely fantastic. And I think the. Um, and thanks for all the questions as well. Yes, I think the, uh, I don't know what I need to do now, hang on, I just need to go and do something quite magical here, but I don't know how to do this anymore, this is, um, I'm going to put that up there somehow, and then we can do a little bit of that, because we should say thank you very much to our sponsors. Yeah, thank you sponsors. So thank you very much, and um, we will see you sometime very, very soon, next week, hopefully, if the laser is fixed, if it's a bit nearly fixed, we'll hopefully have some actual proper yeah, laser thank action. thank you very much. So yeah, fantastic, thank you very much, see you soon. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>